के लिए ग्रुप में लगे हुए हैं लेकिन सर कैन वी स्टार्ट या वी आर रेडी यू कैन गिव मी अ काउंट डाउन स्टार्ट द रिकॉर्डिंग आल्सो सर वी आर गोइंग लाइव इन 5 सेकंड 5 4 3 2 1 one sir we are live now thank you so much uh, from ortho tv good morning friends myself dr arim chandak from nagpur uh, we are having a uh, nails advanced nailing webinar this is episode 2 from the ioa nail sub committee and i am thankful to dr gadi gone for allowing me and myself and uh, dr santosh singh to conduct this webinar uh, we have lot of uh, topics on upper limb nailing nailing in upper limb is an adaptation for various reasons it's a biological procedure it is more cosmetic however there are certain problems so let us understand in this webinar the indications contraindications and the various advantages and disadvantages of nailing procedure um, may i hand over to dr gade gone sir for his introductory remarks please Good morning to viewers of Artho TV, IOA TV, and all over the world. Uh, respected Goel sir, he is our year moderator as well as the expert panel. At least uh, Dr. Sivishankar, past president, and all delegates, uh, those who are viewing. I am thankful to the IOA for giving me this opportunity, Dr. Srivastav, Dr. Ram Chadda, and Dr. Atul Agrawal, they are heading the team and directing us for a repeated webinars on difficult nailing. As I am the chairman of the committee, and Dr. Shiv Shankar is our advisor. I am very thankful to the all esteemed faculties, Dr. Sailesh Pai from Bangalore, Dr. Shiv Shankar, past president from Solapur, Dr. Respected Tanna Sir from Mumbai, myself. Dr. Navin Thakkar from Ahmedabad, Heman Patankar, a famous hand surgeon from Mumbai, Asim Negi, a trauma and joint replacement surgeon from Indore, and our friend Dr. R M Chandak from Nagpur. We are all going to discuss finer points of a nailing in a difficult situation. In a, we know that uh, in upper extremity, the gold standard in all over from clavicle to the forearm. and even in the phalanx stages and uh, meta uh, carpals the nailing is pro, uh, the plating is the gold standard that is the standard teaching but for uh, the constraint of economics as well as the biological principles and the surgery can be done at any place with a lowest cost is the nailing from clavicle to the phalanx so we have a galaxy of experts in this field and i feel that this webinar is going to be a hallmark of a propagation of a nailing in all upper extremity fractures there are some cross views we do agree that all are not interested in doing nailing because of the literature support but with this webinar i think their ideas will be very clear and i think this webinar will be eye opening in the circumstances where we are working thank you very much all iowa functionaries and now i handed over to the dr chandak and dr respected shivshankar sir and dr sc goel sir for further proceeding thank you sir <laughs> thank you gadi gone sir uh, without wasting any time let us start with the first lecture may i invite dr shailesh pai to give his talk on uh, nailing in complex proximal humerus fracture welcome dr shailesh thank you sir respected iowa dignitaries uh, moderators panelists and my dear friends so at the outset i would like to thank the iowa committee for uh, giving me this opportunity to present my work so i'll be talking about nailing in complex proximal humerus fractures so what constitutes a complex fracture in a proximal humerus so we are aware 
that if the three and four part, especially if it's associated with dislocation, it becomes a complex fracture to treat. If there's a head split fracture, it is a tough nut to crack. When there is significant medial combination, our thought process starts to know what we should do because we know that plate in isolation might fail. When there's an anatomical neck fracture, it becomes difficult to reduce and get adequate purchase to hold it. Segmental fractures are also tough in reduction and fixation. And when there is osteoporosis, the implant purchase is a question and hence it becomes a complex fracture of the proximal humerus. So when we are talking of the nailing in proximal humerus fractures, we restrict our talk only to the current generation straight design nail. There are various designs available in the, in, in the current scenario, but all of them have similar features that the insertion point is medial in line with the shaft, in line with the canal of the shaft. So we are not going to damage the footprint of the rotator cuff and hence the functional problems of the previous generation nail are no more there with current generation design. We are able to reposition the tuberosities because it's not a bolt in the current design, but a screw which looks something like this with a washer effect and hence introp splintering of the tuberosities does not happen. Plus, there are holes provided in the screw to which we can anchor the tuberosities. We all know that in proximal humerus, unless the tuberosities heal back to its anatomical location, functionally the patient may be poor. The screw cutout also is no more a concern because of this screw in screw design, which is a tangential locked screw at 30 degrees to the previous bolt, which goes through the nail. And hence physiological forces cannot cut out these screw in screw design screws. And we can go to different components of the proximal humerus, the array as and how the surgeon wishes to. The calcar kickstand screw, which we know works fantastically with the plate has also been now copied in the nail and hence it gives us enough support to overcome the varus forces which is a huge concern in the proximal humerus and the polyethylene bushing within the nail provides enough support and hence the purchase within the bone is not much of a concern anymore so the basic design change has led to a fact that with the plate which is on the surface on loading, there will be continuous varus drifting forces because of cantilever mechanism also, whereas the nail, since it takes its entry through the head of the humerus, will be over, able to overcome the resisting forces much easier. So let us go through some examples and see in complex fractures, how do they behave? So here is a middle-aged middle gentleman with a four-part fracture proximal humerus as seen on the CT. So get a good valgus reduction and pass in the nail and suture the tuberosity. So all of these are equally important, getting a good reduction plus suturing the tuberosities because each of these have a direct role in the final functional outcome of the patient. And we can see that the union is not a concern and the tuberosities heal back in its location and the patient should do good, uh, will be having a good functional outcome at the end of union. What about four part fracture dislocation in elderly? So here is one such patient who was 70 year old gentleman who had a posterior fracture dislocation four part, which was confirmed on CT. The same principles could be used. We could get a reduction, valgus reduction, get back the tuberosities and suture it back and the nail holds it ground. The implant provides enough stability for union and that's his range of movements at the end of four months. A head split fracture, like we all know, is a very, very difficult fracture to treat amongst all fractures in the proximal humerus. So here is a mid 30 year old gentleman who had a pure head split fracture, right? The coronal split confirmed on the CT. Even in this case, the nails do perform much better because we can reduce it, transfix onto glenoid initially, pass in the nail and the surgeon has an option of holding both the parts of the head because he can fashion the screws wherever he wants. Uh, he can go in that particular direction and hence can capture all the elements. That's him at union and that's his range of movements. And I do have his consent for showing his face in the video. So even the toughest of the fracture, as long as we are able to get you good reduction, the implant does provide enough stability for things to heal and function should not be a concern if it heals in its anatomical location. Segmental fracture, again, 
uh, we don't need to bother about the distal fracture as long as we are nailing it. But the proximal fracture, which is a four part in this case, needs accurate reduction, which could be achieved. And the nail does the job for even the distal fracture. Since the locking of the distal uh, part of the nail is multiplanar, that gives the enough stability to overcome torsional forces, which are a huge concern in the diaphysis of the humerus. So that's a metis union and his range of movements. Anatom anatomical neck fracture with osteoporosis. Now here is a elderly patient, anatomical neck uh, with comminution as confirmed on the CT. Even in these cases, as long as you can get a good neck shaft angle, a good valgus reduction and a proper entry point and passing the nail, even though there is significant combination medially and anteriorly as which was uh, seen on the CT, but these are not a concern with the nail, unlike a phyllos plate. So things go on to unite. And as we can see, there is no drift happening between what we achieved in TROP versus what happens in union. Now, this is one area that we all should consider when we do a plate. In the plate, although plate gives good results, but what we often see is that our immediate post-op exit do not look the same when we see at three months. So there will be some mild virus drift happening in all these patients. So in literature, it is about 80% of these patients, we're talking of three and four part fractures in which virus drift happens. Now these might malunite in slight virus, thereby leading to slight loss of abduction, but it does happen in 80% of the patients. Whereas with the nail, at the end of union, it's the same picture as what we see with, at what we finish intraoperatively. So that is the neck shaft angle is maintained. The virus deforming forces do not, uh, oh, I mean, the, the implant is able to overcome the virus deforming forces. So that's this range of movements. 69 year old female osteoporosis and significant combination. The principles remains the same with dislocation. So get a good reduction, a valgus reduction, as we can see in this, this particular case and uh, with the nailing done, and with tuberosity sutured back to the bolts, we could see good healing. And that's the range of movements at the end of four months. Even significantly committed fractures like these, which will be a very difficult proposition to do with a plate, will be much easier with the nail as long as you can get a good neck shaft angle. Now, this was an open fracture, not a bad open, but as long as you can get a good neck shaft angle and suture the tuberosities, since it's much more biological compared to a plate, the healing most almost likely will happen and once it unites the patient will definitely we can expect a good functional outcome sometimes we could have such fractures where there is some bone loss because of an open fracture this was a mid 50 year old lady who had an open fracture of a proximal humerus now to do this with a plate is tricky because we know that plates do not tolerate bone loss even nails don't but with the current generation nail design with so much extra stability being provided and tuberosity is anchored back, we could see a good healing happening. This was her at six months. Unfortunately, she did end up with AVN, but as we can see, there is no cutout or cut through of the screws. This is a two-year follow-up X-ray. And we all know that AVN in the, uh, in the shoulder is not like AVN in the hip. So she will have a decent range of movement. So to summarize, Osteosynthesis of proximal human structure is desirable in most cases because we could achieve good functional results and hence we should be thinking of uh, treating them with a plate or a nail. But the newer generation nails are giving way too good results and we should be considering them. Anatomical reduction with slight valgus if possible, fixation with a nail and suturing of the tuberosities will prevent most of the failures. Thank you very much. Silas, wonderful presentation, wonderful and mesmerizing cases and results. I want to ask you. you one question. Yes, sir. That screw, it is a calcar screw. How yes. often is the possibility of injuring the axillary nerve? Uh, 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 we have done a study ourselves with the South Indian uh, patients and cadavers also. So uh, there is no way we can damage the axillary nerve because it is fixed point of 7.5 centimeters. The entry point in the bone is 7.5 centimeters from the tip of the nail. And we all know that axillary nerve comes around 4.5 to 5.5 centimeters in most patients. So we have a leverage of about 2 centimeters on our side. So uh, we put it percutaneously in all patients and there is not a single incidence of damaging the axillary nerve. Yeah. Good morning and welcome, Tanna, sir. Um, Hello. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Tanna, sir, has requested that he has joined from Zimbabwe and right now the Wi-Fi connection is good. 
So yeah, after, means, after this discussion is over, then he'll be presenting. Silas, another question. Yes, sir. So you, in osteoporotic bone also, you said that the results are very good. But it yes, is a sir. general observation in a three-part and four-part fracture to achieve a, a overhead abduction and forward flexion is a very difficult job. What is your experience in this procedure? So with, with the, this current generation design, the advantage that we have is that there is a polyethylene bushing within the nail. So when we pass in the screw, the bushing itself is giving us enough support. Now on this, the tuberosities are sutured. So healing, we all know healing is not a concern in osteoporosis. The problem was with the previous designs or the plate is the purchase of the implant within the bone. Now here, since the purchase is within the nail and as long as the tuberosities are sutured back and it heals, uh, the patient should not be having any issues with uh, any range of movements, uh, be it flexion or uh, overhead abduction also. Uh, I have shown some of the cases, I mean, at least three of my patients were above 60, uh, one of them was 70 plus. So they did get back uh, near full range of movements, uh, thankfully, due to good reduction and the implant staying its ground. Did you reem for the diaphyseal fracture entry of the nail? For segmental fractures, yes, sir, we do uh, we do ream, but for only proximal humerus fractures, since most of these nails do not cross the isthmus, we don't uh, require to ream the canal as such, but the proximal has an entry reamer. That's that's only for the proximal part. If at all it fails, how do you remove this? Uh, do you open again? Uh, again, it's not it's not technically difficult. I mean. Uh, Fortunately, uh, we didn't see failures to remove, but there were patients who insisted on getting this removed and we have removed two nails till date. Removal is not uh, much of a difficulty, sir, because uh, the, um, the screws come out pretty easy. It just requires the proper instrumentation to get it out. And as far as the proximal part is concerned, since we, we can incise the tendon and see the, see the entry point, we, can, we might as well fix in a uh, conical bolt to get it extract. So removal is not much of a concern also, sir, in case it requires to be removed. Which approach is more preferred, uh, this uh, um, deltoid splitting or uh, anterior approach? Uh, right, sir. So this is this is the uh, anterolateral approach called the anterior acromial approach. This is the approach which uh, 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 shoulder surgeons use for open bank arts repair. So it, it, it's in between deltopectoral and deltoid split. This goes along the anterior border of the acromion. So the, 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 the deeper plane is in between the anterior and the middle fibers of the deltoid. So we are both on the top of the humerlet as well as on its side. So that way it gives us the advantage that uh, whether there's an anterior dislocation or a posterior dislocation, we can address both of either of these with using the same approach. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Thank you. Can, can we, uh, Gadegoni, sir, any, any other question from other faculty members? Probably he has answered all the questions. Any indication for a philos split in your hands? Uh, only if the canal is way too narrow that we will not be able to pass in the nail. I think that may be an indication because okay. the advantage that it biomechanically offers postoperatively is significantly better than a plate. So as long as the surgeon can reduce it, we might as well think of nailing it because uh, the nail takes over the uh, all the loads postoperatively and helps the surgeon in maintaining the reduction that the surgeon took such care to get it in drop. So. If I can't pass in the nail, that's the only indication where maybe we should start thinking of a plate. So in your hand, the philosophy has almost disappeared? Uh, yes, sir. I might say so. That's a very good news. Unless. Because I, I feel the philosophy, philosophy doesn't give you a good range of movement ultimately. In a full range of movement, about two-thirds of the time. While the nail is likely to give you the almost a full range of movement. Exactly. So the, that, the, that's also a concern that phyllos being a surface implant, there may be some mechanical issues uh, directly related to the implant if you do not sit it very perfectly, which is actually challenging for most surgeons because all landmarks are lost in a four-part fracture. So with the nail taking its position intramedullary, there will not be any mechanical impediment, at least for uh, abduction. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Sanjay Desai was with us and he showed innumerable cases with closed unique. And just unique and dr chanda goes on showing that j nailing so do you make any discretion while using your nail and 
using those options which are far more cheaper and easy to do for an average orthopedic surgeon. I mean, technically, I, mean, so, I know. I, I, I don't have any because, personal experience. Because the copy is not going to be as effective and synthesis is damn expensive. Uh, so I, I might resume my opinion there because looking at what happened with the uh, proximal femoral nail, the copies are as good as or even sometimes better than uh, the original. So I, I would resume my comments there. But uh, talking about J nail, I have seen Dr. Chandak uh, doing his magic there, but I don't have any personal experience to comment whether, whether uh, he, he will be a better judge to tell in which cases it might work and which, uh, which are the cases he might not think about it. But as far as just unique is concerned, uh, yes, we do have some results with that. The only concern is now to get the head into position, we need to actually distract it. And that's where many surgeons feel that there may be chances that no, we are... No, no, no. no. Sanjay Desai showed us K-wirings, innumerable K-wirings for three part, up to three part. Um, in, yes, sir. I mean, in very I mean, elite class of patients, which he treats in city like Bombay. And very well, sir. I mean, wow. An um, excellent function. I was really... No, I have also changed over to a K wire in yeah. a three part fracture. In a four part yes, fracture sir. is different thing. Yeah. But in a three part fracture, the K wire works equally well. Whatever the few days of immobilization which you have to do is not Agreed. very significant for the last range of movement. And the function is far Agreed. superior. Agreed. Uh, Dr. Ganjale from Solapuri has asked what is the diameter proximal and distal you use commonly? The proximal di diameter of the nail is fixed at 9.5. The distal diameter is 8 or 9. Uh, but these don't cross the isthmus. We also have a 7 nail. And currently, the Indian uh, companies nails are starting all the way from 6. So 6, 6.5, 7, 7 7.5, that, that way in 0.5 millimeter increments. And the biggest advantage is you can ream because it is a straight reamer. You don't need a flexible reamer. You can ream with the solid reamer. Very true, sir. That also is a, a huge boost. Thank you very much, uh, Sharesh. Wonderful um, lecture and discussion after that. So, Thank let's you, go on to the next lecture. That is lecture number three from Dr. Tanna, sir. He'll be speaking on what happens when the nails fail for fracture humerus. So, I'll be sh sharing his presentation. Friends, thank you very much. I am not in India at the moment. Um, I'm enjoying the Victoria Falls, which is terrific. What I feel is that orthopedic Victoria Falls is something one of the wonders of the world. Anyway, non-union shaft of the femur is my topic. Next. Next. Humerus non-union is very frequently seen now. Earlier, most humerus fractures were treated by plaster or hanging cast, and most ended in union with a minor malunion but excellent function. Now, since the change in lifestyle of not tolerating plaster, surgery has become a treatment of choice. Nobody is sure what to do, nailing, plating, locking, or an ordinary plate. My take is, if there is a fracture of the humerus which is undisplaced or minimally displaced where the soft tissues are intact, they can be treated with the nailing without any major problem. But if the soft tissues are fully displaced, that part of the fracture is not really very good for a nailing because the nailing has a much higher non-union rate into the fully displaced fracture where the soft tissues are not uh, fully <coughs> shifted. <coughs> so today, to me, laving is a decent indication in a minimally displaced fracture which can be treated conservatively or <coughs> segmental fracture where probably the nailing is still a choice. Nothing is done perfect. With changing pattern of surgery, the occasional surgeon does not even acquire a long experience in the skill. Next. 
इट इज इफ ट्रांसवर्स फ्रैक्चर कंप्रेशन डीसीपी होल इज अ मस्ट ट्रांसवर्स फ्रैक्चर इन अ नेलिंग is a poor indication to me because that is a much more higher rate of non union in a fully displaced please mark my words people show me a nailing which is successful but these are most of the fractures which are not fully displaced where the soft tissues are intact in a ma marginally angulated fracture any fixation without compression of this fracture in a plating is likely to fail short oblique fracture no leg to only the compression as it is done here next please and as you can see in this sort of a fracture with the leg screws the fracture heals up very well this is the one which is probably the ideal situation next please and you can see the fracture heals up very well the people have been we have been nailers have been propagating nailing from a long time whether it is really required today in all fractures that is a debatable issue next please now when you do the short oblique fracture leg screw this is what happens the part of the bone gets necrotic and so that is the one which you should avoid short oblique fracture never do a compression does no, sorry never do a leg screw do only a compression next please nailing in transverse fracture gives a higher non union rate next please now this is the nailing done as you can see the there is a distraction at the fracture and this this has ultimately ended up into a non union probably you can say this was not ideally done or whatever it is here is the second nailing the nail got jammed because in those days there was no nailing was done from the tip of from the junction of the tuberosity and the shaft and so there was a, without the flexible reamer you couldn't ream the humerus and that's the reason why in a lower one lower part of the humerus here is a very thin medullary cavity here probably what happened the surgeon was he passed the nail he hammered the nail it got distracted he couldn't take it out because the nail was jammed digitally so he left it like this and this is at the four months non union occurred next please <laughs> this is another case with similar things the nail got jammed and there is a distraction with the comminuted fracture next please nailing of the humerus is now become a fashion is good in indicated patient indication is to be streamlined in spite of all control studies indicating that nailing has more problems compared to plating we interlockers are making those feel inferior who doesn't do a nailing next please nailing of a humerus is now become a fashion interlocking meetings i am made to feel backwards when i state that caution in nailing in transverse fractures humerus nailing is inferior to plating when you compare 50 cases transverse fractures gets distraction in nailing and hence a cause of a delayed or a non union results of nailing or plating best published results of union plating 93 and nailing 67 they haven't separated out <coughs> undisplaced and displaced or minimally displaced fracture but in meeting a powerful good speaker says interlocking nailing humerus is the best operation and shiva is one of the standard one who really sells nailing like anything with all the due respect to you shiva next Thank please you, today surgical treatment arrived in different cycles first rigid evo fixation arrived first that is still standard treatment for transverse or a short oblique fracture fracture fixation with a compression as you can see here nay nee, can you go back as you can see here two arrows in the second slide these are the compression screws there are no screws near the fracture there are only two screws above and three screws below and a long plate fracture heals up completely don't put a screw near the fracture next please then arrived interlocking nail and all of us interlockers told it to surgeons as a wonder treatment how can i say i was wrong at times now i say i oversold it in my time we learned over the years limitation of nailing in humerus we had already told you all that nailing is good for humerus next please then arrived an anti the breech plate as all of you know this has become a fashion today but you can see in a young female it leaves this scar which is very difficult for them to expect 
that this is going to be the completely, completely lifetime. So that this has not become acceptable to the young females. Next, please. So these are the nailings which you can see in olden time. This plating was done, then nailing was done, and then the nail went out. The nail, the fracture collapsed. Next, please. And ultimately, it was held up with a compression plate. <coughs> <coughs> Um, now you can see this held up with the compression plate. So nailing is still unsure in all fractures. Here is again a nailing in a lower one third. Now you can see in lower one third there is hardly any hold of the fragment. Lower down. <coughs> so next. So Indian Jugaad. After this nailing, since it is not stable, Indian Jugaad this splint. <laughs> Second patient, the same, Indian Jugar. This oblique fracture is not stable in nailing. This oblique fracture is very stable in compression plating. But they still, we advocate nailing and if we continue to do nailing with this sort of a problem. Next. Compression is the key. Transverse fracture, compress. Short oblique fracture, compress. Long oblique fracture, leg screw. Compression with this DCP holes or with this Muller device, whatever it is. And as that I, again I'm mentioning, the short oblique fracture, compress. First you put it on the acute side, which is here. And the second one, compression, you do it from the obtuse side. Because if you do the other way around, the fracture will displace. Next, please. Again, a nailing. This was the nail which I had shown you earlier. It had distracted. After four months, there was no problem removing it because by that time it had become loose. So I removed it and I did the compression plating and the fracture held up extremely well. Nail came out easily as there was no problem. And he has developed a full range of movement. But still the nail was jutting out for about three months, four months. And still, when I removed the nail and did the plating, he has developed a full range of movement. This was the most surprising thing for us. And this has been observed again and again. That nail jutting out is not much of a problem most of the time. Next, please. Now here, this is also again, you can treat it. Why happened? Distant medi medulla cavity, small nail jam, couldn't go in, hammered the nail, couldn't go out. And that's the reason why the fracture got distracted and will not come out, will not go in. Could have been avoided if the small reamers were used, which is not easily available in all the facilities. You need the flexible reamers, which are also available only by a few companies, starting from five millimeters. Next, please. This was the case. X fix first. Next. Nailing second. Nail failed, screws broke out. This is the stage I saw with the nail which has been out like this and treated after 10 years of surgery injury and did the philos plate with the big bone graft in between iliac, iliac crest and the cancellous bone graft you can see. And he has obviously the range of movement is restricted, but the fracture is completely healed up. That's the reason why the nailing the other observation is with the nailing, patient can carry in next, uh, sorry, can you go back please? Uh, with the nailing, the patient can go on for a long time till the time the nail breaks. If the nail doesn't break, patient can still functional. While the plating, the plating doesn't hold on as much. The plate will break down, so he'll come for surgery much more faster. And with the nailing, when he carries on, he loses a lot of bone at the fracture side because of the movement which is occurring at the fracture site. So that's the reason why quite often you will need a fibula or a massive iliac crest bone graft. Next, please. This is again, 65 year old, five years of fracture, four surgeries, nailing, plating, x fix and everything, infection, so infection is controlled. And this is the stage I came to, know, to see this patient. Five years after the fracture. Again, you can see in such a fracture, Intramedullary fibula is this situation. 
I take half the fibula because in humerus you can't do a full fibula. So half the fibula, long phyllos, cancellous bone graft, intramedullary fibula, long plate and cancellous bone graft. Next, please. And then the fracture heals up. 15 months after the fracture, fracture is healed up completely well. And his range of movement is, this is the range of movement. So even after such a long time, the game is not lost. You can always do this and you will be able to have a decent range you know, of movement. You know. so movement will be lost in a final range of movement. But you can see external rotation is also good. External rotation. Next. Now here was the fracture. It, it, surgeon did a good job. Good leg screw and a long plate. But that long plate was a thin little plate. That's not good enough to really avoid the stress at the fracture. So this was a thin plate. You can see this was a recon plate. Next, it broke down. So all it needed was a long thick plate and the fracture heals up. Heal in three months time. The original treatment was okay. Small recon plate, too thin and hence bent. Normal plate would have solved this problem. Next. Now here is the plating, defective plating. Screw is in the fracture. Only two screws are above. The plate should have been much longer. And this could have been compressed or a leg screw. But this is the one which is a bad plating which is done. Next, please. Normal thick plate, one screw in the fracture and two screws proximally. These two screws too near the fracture. No leg. So this is the one which is conserved and ended up in non-union. My, my take is, can you go back one? My take is, conservative treatment of the humerus, again, is a good treatment when there is not a fully displaced fracture. Because the soft tissue is very well preserved, so you can reduce it properly. Soft tissues play a very important part in healing. That is the reason why not fully displaced but angulated fractures do well in conservative treatment and also in nailing. Now this fracture ended up into non-union. Next please. So long fracture, the long leg screw, as you can see, and a long plate with four screws distally, three screws proximally and a leg screw, and the fracture healed up completely well. So non-union, whatever it is, is not an issue you will be able to get the fracture healed up majority of the times with this. I had seen the fracture after 12 years of non-union. Still, you can get a union. I think it is there next. Next, please. Now, this is the leg screw which you have to do it. Most, I'm putting it again and again. The leg screw, most of the people don't do it properly. You will have to explore both the ends of the fracture in order to do the 100% reduction. And then, oh, proximal... First screw is a 3.5. Wider than the threads of the screw. And then uh, so that, the that is the glide hole. The first cortex. Then you put in a drill sleeve so that the next hole is going to be coaxial. So now a 2.5 drill. Smaller drill bit to drill a pilot. So now it is coaxial. Pilot hole is the same. Now diameter. you can put in the screw. You have already reduced the fracture. You have held it the fracture. Do the leg screw. It will glide through the glide hole in the first cortex. And then the fracture gets completely pressed, compressed. Cortex. Most of the people don't do it the ideal way That's this has right. to be done. Next, please. Screw, press it. Because if you don't do this, you first put in a big screw. You first put in a 2.5 drill and then put in a 3.5 drill. Next. Then you put in a 3.5 drill. Then the two holes are not coaxial. As you can see, this is what has happened. The fracture which is reduced, you put in a screw. Next, please. The screw gets oblique. It has a hole in the proximal fragment also, which it should not have. And that's the reason the fracture gets displaced and there is no compression. That's the reason you must follow exactly the way I have described and the way it is there in the literature. Next, please. This is the fracture. Compressed. Reduction is not perfect. Compression fracture is not enough. Next. Six months. The fracture bent. 
11 months, 19 months, the fracture, substantial fall, but if the fracture is related, it would not have opened out at the fracture. Again, replating with leaving the fracture area completely without any screws, but primary union due to compression. Five months replating, compression, grafting needed or not, that was debatable, but I grafted and got a perfect healing done that. So second surgery, if you do it properly, is always going to be better. Compression of the transverse or a short oblique fracture, leg for a long oblique, good minimum three screws on either side of the neutralization and a slightly longish plate. Now this is after five surgeries, infection, implant removed two years, no infection. 70-year-old, severe parotid. She was denied surgery. I had operated on the leg first and she was in the hospital where I saw this. Conventional plate would have had a poor hold on this. Next, please. Hello. So excise the ends which are pencil thin. Take a fibula without periosteum. It is easier retrieval without then with the periosteum. Dilate the humeral medullary cavity mainly to measure the cavity. Confirm it is movable in the humerus. Medullary cavity on both sides of the fracture easily. Keep large autograph ready from the iliac crest. Giving finishing touches, reconfirm graft is moving in the canal. Push it up all the way proximally, reduce the fracture, distract, hold fibula end, and slowly push it distally. Compress the fracture maximally, load consolation bone graft singling. But when you compress, your one screw has to be outside the fibula, because if it is inside the fibula, then it will not compress. Both the screws are inside the fibula, it will not compress. Cast brace for my peace of mind. And then you can see this fracture perfectly held up after so many non-unions and all. Next. Head put in intramedullary fibula and shorten the humerus getting compaction. Thank the locking plate. This could be done without in the locking plate. This could not have been done. Six months, the fracture is fully united. Next, please. This was a this was a pediatric orthopedic cardiac surgeon treated in the, in the unit where this was best treated. First operation, no compression. Second operation, adjuvant plating. Both failed. Both failed. This is the X fix was done by one of the competent um, external fixation surgeon with the fibula inside. And then it also went into non union. So, four years after the injury, I saw the patient had a long plate. Intramedullary fibula was already there. After four years of surgery, cancellous bone graft and the fracture healed up. The pediatric cardiac surgeon. You can imagine the first surgery would have solved the problem if the patient was treated with the compression properly. And this is the one which was operated upon in the city because he is a surgeon. He was, can you go back? Can you go back? He was operated by the two best surgeons of the city. So senior best surgeons with the maximum money earning does not assure you a maximum knowledge which is required for these fractures. Next, please. This was a fracture, humerus treated, nail broke down, lower down. So I had to do the jugad, bend the stinman pin to take the nail out and then put it intramedullary bone. As you can see, the nail is now coming out. I had put in the whole ear and then the fracture heals up completely well. As you can see it very well. This was again a nail, non-union. The, the surgeon, yeah, the, you can see there is a light. I see the fracture. Same surgeon, next please. After six months, he did this small little piddly little plate. And then I went, I had came into the picture. I did this intramedullary fibula and a long plate. Four months after that, you can see he has a full range of movement. And still after all these things, patient has got an excellent range of movement, nailing, plating, non-union, four years have passed by. Till he has a good range of movement. So don't give up. Conclusion. Shaft humerus can be very nasty. Multiple surgery is not uncommon if the first surgery fails. Nailing is having more non-union rate but is excellent for segmental fracture. MIPPO for community is ideal. Compression plating is treatment of choice in most transverse 
and short oblique fractures and for most non-union. I have never treated a non-union with the nailing again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And the transmission from your end was absolutely fabulous. So voice was very clearly heard. Any questions to Tanna, sir? There is Actually, me. Tanna, sir, should go to Zimbabwe every time when he has got a presentation. <laughs> Such a beautiful <laughs> presentation. No, no, really, sir. The transmission was excellent. Now, I think that this is one of those super-duper hotels in Zimbabwe. Uh, the way we are discussing before the lecture about uh, nailing and uh, plating in the humerus and uh, why nailing should be done because it's more biological. So, Dr. Tanna, what do you will say about that? As I said, apples and oranges have to be separated out. Yes. Minimally displaced humerus, nailing is good. Same thing can be treated conservatively. But fully displaced humerus, I feel yeah. nailing is inferior to plating. Uh, Tanna, sir, about the complication of uh, plating, you said is about uh, a plate union is about more than 90 percent, and union with nailing is uh, 66 or 68 percent. You showed 67 percent, yeah, yeah. I think that is statistics. Uh, I'm telling you, I, I don't know, that is a very bad nailing. I think we, that person who does that has to go back and learn nailing technique, Shiva. Yes, sir. I think every time. Every Every time we want to propagate our method, we always say the other people who got complication in that method is a wrong surgery. Yeah. When Dr. Sujiokova advised that uh, abduction osteotomy of the AVM, we yeah. all said we all said other people couldn't do it. Sujiokova was a good surgeon; he could do it. So, would you say only Shiva can get a best result? I don't think so, sir. I don't think uh, everybody is getting good results with nailing. Uh, I will ask the other people, Kadegone or uh, so the statistics. Asim. You you don't believe in statistics, is it true? Yeah, because the people who are sitting in the uh, thing, those who don't do nailing properly, they compare. <coughs> we are comparing again. If you are comparing a good nailing done by a good surgeon versus a good plating by done by a good surgeon, we should compare. What happens is no, I, I have a good data. But if I do I a plating, it may be inferior than what you do. So I, my results of plating might be more bad. But so, Shiva, that goes for every surgery. Every uh, data you say in the literature and any surgery where the data, uh, the, it doesn't show that the complications are more, you say it was a bad surgeon. Yeah, that's what I feel. <laughs> because Shiva, I don't think it is. Yeah. Shiva, Shiva, again, I think, Shiva, when you had presented yes. on a nailing, I was there onto the plating side. And I, yeah, I discussed this. Your yes. every case was a minimally yes. displaced humerus. And that is the one where the soft tissues are intact. And that will 100% do very well. So I think unless you open out oranges and apples separately, you do for a fully displaced humerus, nailing, transverse fracture, and if it succeeds 90% of the time, it's a good operation. That's correct. So in non-union case, what about double plating? Um, Satish, I don't think you de you need a double plating. You need a long plate. You need a long plate, and if your stabilizer, if your uh, contact is not very good because the bone loss is more, then you should do a fibula. Because double plating, you are uh, eliminating a quite a lot of bone for a healing process. I have never done a double plating for a non-union. I have, if any hesitation, I go ahead and do a fibula intramedullary. Go, go ahead, sir. Yeah. I don't use the fibula. I do two <laughs> plates. The first plate is a stronger plate, which is my primary plate for the humerus. And second plate, which is placed at a 60 or 70 degrees suitable, about 10, 12 hole plate and only four screws, two above, one hole number one and three. And wherever I get only two screws in that plate, that is at an angle. And I never use the fibula. And I have done a 40 year old non-union. I'll send you the whole PP. 40 year, he was 66. 40-year-old non-union operated six times. So every method is good if you know how to yeah. do it. If you do it well. Yeah, yeah I yeah, think probably good. the key to Nagy's thing is he is using a thin plate so that he is preserving a lot of bone for a healing process. Second is a bypass plate. Tana, sir, your thought process on 
posterior approach of plating diaphyseal fracture or anterior lateral? Most of your cases you have done from anterior lateral? I, no, no, I do only posterior. Only posterior plate? Only posterior. Anterior lateral, somehow I feel I am not very comfortable after having done it initially. I only do posterior because I have a long, I, I can go as high as possible, as low as possible. And I am fond of a longer plate rather than a shorter plate. Okay. I have never used a six-hole plate. It is always an eight-hole plate with the two screws near the fracture which are vacant. Okay. In a transverse fracture, in an oblique fracture, it will have to be nine-hole, ten-hole, whatever it is. And that in works. the plating, proximally, proximally, don't cut the triceps. Only make a small artery and windows in the in the whole area and put in the screw. Because if you cut the triceps, you will probably damage the nerve supply partially to that. And that's the reason why it is much easier to go ahead, fill the hole, and only with the artery, open up the hole and put in the screws. Even the radial nerve is not uh, put in a loop. It is just made a tunnel. Yeah, yeah. And only tunnel, plate is tunneled beneath that. Really and the radial nerve is kept with the soft know. tissue. Once you know the radial nerve, you go underneath, and yeah. with the soft tissue thing, it has been kept there. Right. With this, uh, thank you very much, sir. With this, we we'll move on to the next lecture from Dr. Sir, thank you very much from Jafar from Zimbabwe. <laughs> and uh, we are grateful to you that uh, on a topic like this, you are the best person. And I actually convey to you that we are not getting a speaker uh, for this topic. Thank you for invitation, uh, for your uh, yeah, our acceptance of invitation. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, we invite you from Professor for his talk on complex humerus nailing for segmental and distal humerus, various tips and tricks. Go ahead, sir, please. Yes. So I'll be talking about uh, segmental and extreme humeral uh, fractures, how nailing can be done. So because I'm showing so many segmental fractures, don't be carried away that uh, the segmental fractures of humerus are very, very common. No, I might have treated in the last uh, 30 years, which can be counted on my fingertips only. So I have collected the presentations of cases from Dr. Gade Gone, Dr. Pradeep Kotadia, Dr. Milin Joshi and Dr. Shailesh Pai and thank for them for allowing me to use for this academic purpose. Coming to the segmental fractures of the humerus, they are due to high energy trauma and instability is very, very common and uh, neurovascular insult is also very common. Conservative treatment is one of the option, but uh, it may not give 100% union at one of the fracture site. So we, it is not, that's the reason why we don't advocate conservative treatment. This patient was not at all willing for surgery and reluctantly the surgeon treated with the conservative treatment. You can see that there is a virus happening at the shaft site, but in due course of time, the fracture healed and the patient had a excellent function in spite of the virus. Shortening and little virus is very well tolerated by this uh, humerus. And you can see that in spite of the virus, he has got a good function of the shoulder and the fracture has healed beautifully. Friends, in this modern era where the customer is the king or the patient is the king, with optimal conditions of the patient, surgeon and the instrument available, internal fixation probably is a better of treatment. Myself and Gadegone, we have published a paper on the keyhole interlocking nailing surgeries and we have concluded that it's a cosmetic surgery, less soft dissection is required, preserves the biological environment so that the fracture union happens quite quickly. Reduction is very, very important, especially the central portions and you have to put a reamed nail. You cannot put an unreamed nail because the nail will be too thin and that will the one reason why the complication rate in the humerus is more because we don't ream and put a thinner nail. The medullary canal proximally is wider and distal it is very, very narrow. So we can pass the narrowest nail only in such cases. So better to hold the middle fragment either with a unicortical shan screw or even with a bone holding forceps 
ream it properly and then you can do the nailing then there shouldn't be any problem this is one such fragment segmental fracture you can see that with small keyhole incisions we have been able to do the nailing as long as there are two locking proximally and two locking distally then the stability is quite good this is my one of the earliest case in 1999 i have treated this segmental fracture of the humerus at that time even we were not having the locking bolts the nail was not allowing the 4.5 mm cortical screw also for locking so we had to use a thick k k wire and use it for locking proximally and that was the time between 1996 to 2002 i was not doing any distal locking this nail i have used is not even having a distal locking hole at that time and the patient ended up having a good union and with a good function another young lady she came with radial nerve palsy as I, we said earlier the chances of having a radial nerve palsy is very very high in a segmental fracture humerus because of uh, it's a high velocity trauma there is literature support saying that if there is a radial nerve palsy it's not necessary to open and see the radial nerve if you are planning to do the nailing you can go ahead and do the close nailing only if you are opening for whatever the reason like if you are plating from posterior aspect and the nerve is coming in the way then only you can open and see the nerve otherwise there is no necessity to look into the nerve if there is a nerve radial nerve palsy again in my uh, orthopedic career i might have seen about 10 odd cases of radial nerve palsy with shaft fracture shaft humerus and i, I never had the opportunity to open and all of them have uh, recovered in due course of time in about 3 to 6 months time this lady started showing recovery in about 3 months time and by about 4 months time she had a good recovery and this is the x ray at 4 months time this is at the time of fracture uh, implant removal you can see the happy face on the lady for having got a good recovery without any major scar on her arm this is another case uh, sometime into early 2000 Uh, you can see that there is a fracture shaft and the fracture neck and there was a fracture of the greater tuberosity also the interlocking nail available at that time was locking at the surgical neck level so i got a, a jig design and also a nail design which can be used to do the locking from the greater tuberosity into the inferior part of the neck and this is how we treated by a close nailing with one screw above and one screw below and in due course of time the fracture healed without any problem nowadays there is multi locking nailing available and it is really good because uh, proximally as well as distally you can do the multi locking and the stability obtained with a multi lock nail is far far better than a single screw or even a double screw system of the humerus we were using earlier that is the reason why the results nowadays are far better with the humerus nailing and even for a regular shaft fracture of the humerus nowadays i prefer to use a proximal multi lock humerus uh, rather than using a simple one or two locking system available this slide already dr shailesh pai has shown uh, proximally you can see that the head is uh, fractured in three part and there was a shaft fracture it has been treated with a multi lock nail as long as you get good abduction or valgus of the proximal fragment the main the kick stand screw prevents any varus collapse happening the screw in screw also prevents the varus collapse happening and the patient will have excellent outcome another similar fracture a segmental fracture again the head fragment you can see uh, you open up with the anterolateral approach of the shoulder and put the nail from the top from the articular surface and then you align the proximal fragment to the distal fragment to the nail and then you expect a, a good result in all these cases like this so this is the excellent outcome at the end of the treatment then this is a i am not totally against uh, plating plating if it is done only gives good result but unfortunately plating requires lot of exposure the scar especially in young ladies and that they are the reasons why i prefer to do nailing and this is the same patient with a excellent plating done you can see the excellent result could be obtained nailing is blamed only because of the bad nailing 
this is a case of a bad nailing being done which was treated with again plating and you can see that uh, here in this case you can see the fracture and plating has been done and the end result can you listen to me rajan chandak hello yes yeah, sir yes sir you are audible sir Okay. Yeah, we are all audible. Yeah, we are okay. not audible. Because there was yeah, no, there was no sound. I thought whether I have, I have gone no, up no, there. No. Okay. No, we are all mesmerized, Shiva. Okay, fine. Thank you. So it this is. is the same patient where the poor nailing was done, which was treated with a plating. Patient uh, ended up having a excellent outcome. Coming to the next part of my talk, the extreme nailing. What I am talking extreme nailing is the very distal fractures of the humerus. Yes, as long as you are able to put one screw. Definitely, these fractures can be treated in this fashion. You can see a segmental fracture with an extreme distal fracture. This is a case of 1999 when I was not doing any distal locking because the nail I was using, I thought that the humerus requires dynamization. So, I was never doing distal locking. So, whatever the hole was there in the distal part of the nail, I eliminated at that time. Sometime between 96 to 2002, all my cases you can see that the nail was not having a whole majority of the time. So when this patient, a third, second or third year engineer student came to me, he wanted to write a paper on the next day. So what I did was I inserted a nail from the top and as the nail was very uh, rotationally unstable in the distal fragment, I used the X fix. The proximal shan spin has gone through the locking hole in the nail. And this is a hybrid case I have done and I have done very few number of cases. Don't think that uh, uh, since I'm showing three, four cases, don't think that I do left and right. Very selective cases you can do this hybrid fixation. The, basically, I'm preventing the rotation and also I'm achieving some compression with the external fixator distally. And this patient went, I discharged him on the next day itself. He went back, gave this uh, examination and he is now a working engineer. So this is after the fixator has been removed, patient had an excellent outcome. Another comminuted fracture, again, you can see I have passed nail where I'm showing with the finger and I added a hybrid external fixator and the patient really do, did doing good. Unfortunately, as you can see, the distal humerus, the lateral condyle is wider. So the nail has a tendency to go towards lateral side and few of my cases, there was a varus. Though varus is not that significant in the humerus, but I wanted to avoid it. So nowadays what I do is I pass the nail through the olecranon fossa. You can see that I have pierced the olecranon fossa. I have passed the nail through that and I have done the distal locking and the alignment is far, far better in this case. This was an advocate I have treated and he had not come for follow-up subsequently, but uh, the fracture has united because I spoke to him on phone. Here you can see that I am passing a straight rigid reamer over a plain guide wire and then I am trying to open up the olecranon fossa and there I have passed the nail. So this is the extreme nailing you can do even in a, even I have done a few cases where this, the distal fragment is much more smaller also. I have done this nailing in such cases. This is the immediate post operative picture and follow up pictures at 8 weeks and follow up pictures at four months, you can see that the fracture has healed without any problem with a beautiful anatomical restoration. Uh, Dr. Tanna uh, commented that uh, when a humerus fails, uh, nailing is not the option, but he has not done the probably the nailing. But here is an example where a in, improperly done plating failed twice. So in this case, I was involved in at this stage when the second time plating was also failing. So what I did was I did a nailing plus augmentation plate with bone grafting. This is just at around four months time, the fracture consolidated. This is the clinical picture of the same patient at about nine months time. So if you know how to tackle it, definitely there is a role for you to use nail even in cases where the humerus fracture is not united. Another case, this nailing was done elsewhere about eight years back and the patient came with a non-union with a uh, mobility at the fracture site. Again, I have done the same way, nailing with augmentation plate with bone grafting. So the nail gives long, long stability and the small plate gives near, near stability. The patient never came for follow-up and recently uh, in December 2021, 
I message his son to send the pictures. So these are the X-rays sent by his son, X-ray as well as the clinical pictures. So I have not seen the patient, but you can see that the patient had a excellent outcome in spite of uh, all that non-union. Many times we blame saying that the, doing a nailing is a keyhole surgery, but removal will be a major surgery. But if you use the CM properly, judiciously, you enter under the CM control through the earlier scar into the nail and insert the conical board for extraction. Then if you do the extraction properly, the removal need not have to be a very major surgery. It can also be a, a keyhole surgery like the uh, implant uh, insertion. To conclude, humerus nailing is a good method of treatment. Keyhole surgery is possible, not as bad as it is detect, depicted in the literature. Complications are slightly higher than plating. Uh, I am quoting some other literature. What Dr. Tanna quoted was different. Uh, this uh, 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 review article said that the plating has a complication of 4% and the nailing has a complication of 7%. So there are... You can quote whatever suits you also. That's another thing. There are all varieties of uh, uh, papers are available in the net. Complications with segmented fracture humerus is almost to the tune of 20% because definitely it's a difficult fracture to nail. And humerus fracture does not tolerate gap. So it's always better to compress on table and never allow any gap at the fracture set. So friends, do it properly. It will not disappoint you. That's what I want to convey. I am not selling nailing because I am not oh, involved with any of the company, but definitely, yes, since it has given good results in my hand, yes, I am definitely a proponent of nailing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shiva, sir. And you yeah, always, always, always learn back uh, slapping and giving compression yeah, after doing a good nail. That was a trick we always learn from you. Thank you so much. Any Santosh questions, Singh. Shiva, sir? Ah. Santosh Singh, you welcome. Sir. Sir, sir, thank you, sir, so much. Sorry for the late joining. No issue, no issue, no issue. But, but, but it is always mesmerizing to hear the Dr. Shiv Shankar. I'm lucky to have there at the right time. Thank you so much. Sir, good morning. Okay. Any, sir. any questions? To... Sir, uh, Dr. Shiv Shankar, sir. Yes. Uh, when, you, when you prefer in the distal uh, humerus fracture, the nailing or plating, is there any criteria for that one or uh, uh, voluntary you to do the same thing? No, no. It doesn't mean that I only do plating and nailing in all these cases. Yes, I do prefer to use with the availability of uh, locking plate, the curved one, which sits on the lateral condyle. Definitely, yeah. yes, I am using more of the, them rather than the hybrid external fixation with the nailing. So, sir, is, is, is there any uh, uh, absolute indication for the nailing in that cases? Absolute indication for nailing is not there. Everything is whatever. If you feel that you are able, you are able to do it, then you can do it. That's what I say. There is nothing like absolute indication. When you see an X-ray, whatever comes to your mind, if you think sir. that it is a good case for plating, then go ahead and do plating. Just because somebody says nailing is a good option, don't do it. Whatever comes to your mind so, when you see the X-ray is the treatment, best treatment in your hand. That's what sir. I always tell. So Thank the, you so much, sir. So the Thank indication you. depends on giving back function to patient and whatever his desirement is. Uh, after discussing this, so choice of a plate and a nail all depends on a uh, lot of these factors. Thank yeah. you very much, sir. Uh, after this, Dr. Navin Thakkar, can you... Um, Navin, can you hear us? No, oh, he's not here. No, oh, he's he, there. He's joined. He joined. He joined. I, I, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here, oh, okay. sir. Yeah. Hello, so, sir. Navin, bye. Yeah. I'll, I'll invite <laughs> Navin for uh, presenting his topic. Navin, is this fine for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem, sir. No problem, sir. Uh, but in between, you'll have to stop the video. Sorry, because I am I am I am traveling here in the no, Uttarakhand. No problem. I'll I'll do that. So this is you stop it. You stop before that. Before that. Yeah. Ah, this is the fracture. This is regarding the flexible nailing. Ah, possibility. Oh, huh? this is one of the possibility. Here was the fracture of lower third. 
with the butterfly fragment and very difficult to plate it. You have to use extra articular plate and uh, you have to open up completely. But another way of doing this possibility of passing a flexible nail from the lateral condyle and try to get the stability. Here, this shows the first flexible nail has been passed through the lateral condyle. It's a very good pillar here. You can see here. Mm -hmm. And you can go next, sir. What we do is we are doing multiple flexible nailing. Now we have changed to a flexible nail just to get it reduced, then put an anterior bridge plate. But previously, no. in certain cases, we were doing endless supply of you are, you are change it, you are change it, sir. You yeah, change yeah. it, you change it. That's easier than you might yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just click OK, bus. that's all. Or your home, so you have especially to start in case of an emergency. So no, 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 you stop this unreliable. Again, you said it, or you're just, just tired just of me. relying on moment. the big. Is that fine? So, go ahead. No, no, now, now it is not sharing. No, it is not shared. You have to share it again. That link, yeah, I'll, I'll just share. No problem. No, no problem. No. I think the link has so you are downloaded or uh, you are showing online online I was showing okay no problem you you just click that link it will appear at that time you can go ahead the discussion yes just... yes yes so what we do is a flexible nails which is introduced through a dense bone of the lateral condyle and one flexible nail then the second flexible nail in a s or c shape it gets contoured automatically and it gives the multiple contact points with multiple surface points. These are much more flexible than routine titanium elastic nails. This can be also be used as an adjuvant in the humerus. Now we are doing with the anterior bridge plate. Can you open up, sir? Yeah. Can you see this? No, no. You are not said it. You, 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 you are seeing yourself in the screen, but uh, everybody is not seeing. Okay. Just so share. first you share it. Uh, desktop and then click that link in the email. Yeah. yeah. Now you can make it full. Able to see that now? Uh, you make it full. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So second nail you can see here. And the third nail. AP and the lateral view. And this flexible nail goes in the different direction in the humerus in the upper part. And gives stability yes the third nail i think so at this point many many nails just try to come out of the fracture gap and it becomes yes 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 at that time you have to take care of the reduction and once it is aligned very well and you have to make a different curvature at the tip if you feel that it is coming out from lateral side then you have to make a slightly uh, bend the tip on the middle side. Same way in the anterior and posterior. So it is uh, taking away the different quadrants, different points in both the planes. Okay. Some of the nails may have an anterior bend. Some of the may, uh, nails may have a posterior bend. Some of the nails may have a medial bend. Some of the nail may have a lateral bend at the tip. So you have to keep on playing with the curvature and bending of the nails. Yes, 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 yes. And but but the rest of the part in the shaft, it takes automatically the, uh, the, the shape of the shaft. And these nails all are passed from the lateral side only? Uh, from the lateral side only, not on the middle side. Because it is a middle side, again, there will be ulna now. So you have to explore completely. Here it is a very small incision. You will see that clinical picture also. Yeah. This and is the, the lateral view. Yeah. Uh, this is the picture of clinical. This is the incision where the lateral condyle, we have made a uh, with the owl, we make a hole there and guide in the lateral condyle when it opens in the canal. And you can see here, there is a multiple contact and multiple surface contact, multiple plane. So multi-plane fixation is there. Right. Such a lower fracture, we feel that it may not get united. And yes, this is the TV anchor. 
TV9 anchor. And you can see after removal, what is the shape? It is not the same shape which when it was introduced. This is after removal. So it takes the shape, very short uh, video was there. These nails we are using as an adjuvant for anterior bridge plate. When there is a lower third or a higher fracture, then these nails give the reduction for the surgeon. And then you can, over that, you can have a MEPO plate. Okay. Gadikoni, sir, what is your choice of fixation for this distal third humerus when there is a communicated piece, very classical third piece is there in the distal third? So, your Inter choice? Interfract compression and uh, long plate, posterior lateral plate. So, you'll prefer a yes. long plate. No. Negi, what is your choice for this difficult plate. zone? Same. Same, Same. as Dr. Gadikon. Okay, plate you will prefer rather than nailing procedure. But I do, I do the Navin Thakkar's method quite often. So you also prefer condylocephalic nail as well? Yes. So yes what yes, patient yes. you prefer a plate fixation and what patient you prefer a nail fixation? Depends on uh, patient's requirement, choice or your choice. Garib Das patient I do with flexible nailing and uh, when a very good patient and good colleague I do plating. Okay, that is and your differentiation. No, no confusion. <laughs> Okay. I mean, by I get the impression that these nails are different than uh, tense nails, which yes, are yes, yes. Uh, it's the flexibility is different. It is three times more flexible, and the strength is the same as the titanium elastic nails. I request all get... the panelists to please open up their uh, videos. How do we get? Yes, yeah, still it is uh, biomechanical testing stage is not still over. It's not commercially available still. Okay. Because we have to make the metal like that it's a metallurgy changes we have to make to get the more flexibility but not reducing the strength okay. shalish your choice for this distal third humerus where there is a butterfly fragment you would prefer a plate or a, a nailing procedure yeah i do i i will prefer a plate sir for them for them a plate uh, a posterior plate with a, the lateral column plate what you would prefer like screw with a periodical plate in most cases okay thank you Yes, yes, that, that is the routine treatment we are doing. This is the one of the possibilities just we are showing. <laughs> Standard treatment is there, but there is a possibility of minimally invasive fixation. Okay. No, why, and alternate, why, it is, it no, is not no, the only treatment. No, even by why we should shy away from this minimally invasive a biological method? I think yes, yes, it it is, we are not shying away. We are not ah, shying no, away. No, because the people are not doing it and it is not put it in literature. That does not mean that it's not a very good method. Just like radius cellular nail, radius cellular nail, people will combat like anything that it is intra-articular and you have to do plating only because EO says that it is too, mm -hmm. plating should be done. Mm -hmm. Dr. Didi Tanna, sir, presented in Patna and somebody argued that, uh, sir, this is the wrong method. Only the plating should be done. EO recommends only plating. I, I think Dr. Tanna, sir, is there or not? I, I was there in that lecture. Yeah. So that is always a controversial thing, whether to use a nail or a plate. It depends. Whatever you give the patient uh, function back and what he desires, I think that is where we have to choose. So after this uh, wonderful presentation by Dr. Navin Thakkar, we go ahead to presentation by Dr. Uh, Gadegone, sir. And I would uh, uh, request Dr. Gadegone to present your talk on fracture both bone forearm. There is very few literature on nails authentic literature about nailing in forearm fractures. Um, can you go ahead, please? Sir? So, good morning, sir, everybody. And Sandak, sir, it's a most controversial topic. And I will try to... Uh, my I express my views regarding the nailing adult forearm fracture. So, Sandak, sir, and please all the, uh, the, 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 the faculty members here, to tell you very frankly, majority of them, they are doing nailing, but they are very shy of projecting their work that the forearm nailing they work. It's because, as you said, that the literature quotes that the plating is the gold standard. And therefore, uh, we tend to believe that plating is the only treatment for forearm fractures. So begin with this, a nailing in adult forearm fractures. Crux, the restoration of the radial bow is the important in the reconstitution of normal architecture of the forearm 
and in the restoration of rotation and grip strength. Hence, non-operative treatment is not advocated. Treatment options remain intramodular layering and plate osteosynthesis. Literature says fracture of the forearm should be treated as an intraarticular fracture. Most accepted method is the open reduction and internal fixation by plate. Cross view, plate and screw fixation, extensive surgical exposure and periosteal stripping, compromised vascular supply, increased operative morbidity, infection and refracture after removal of plate is the common occurrence in Indian scenario where worker working on a very compromised situation, plate quality is not good and surgical environment is also not conducive for a very exposed uh, bone for a very long time. So in the history of an alternative method of intramodulary fixation in 40s and 50s, diaphyseal forearm nailing with KY, small raspy needed very poor result due to lack of stable fixation. The first oversized straight square shaped rim nail was developed by Street in 1954 and restoration of radial bow was introduced by Sage in 1959 with the development of pre-bent nail system and in pioneer in India, A.K. Talwalkar Mumbai designed and procreated this square nail and he had shown that the open reduction and internal fixation with compression plate is a gold standard 98% urea rate, but with the nailing, it is 92% union rates, very, very, it's only 6% uh, difference, but it's a minimal invasive surgery. This is one of the example. You can see a good union after the fracture both bone forearm with the Talwalkar nail. Marek and Talwalkar achieved 100%. Curry et al. showed union rate 95%. Moda et al. observed 90%. The average period of POP mobilization was six weeks. But there are pitfalls of unlocked nail. A straight rigid nail could not restore the radial bow. And thin nail permits rotatory and substantial lateral motion at the fracture side. Hence, non-union, malunion, infection, nerve palsy, joint stiffness, and jamming of the nail and splitting of the shaft, they are all reported complications after nailing. But the most important complication is breaking up with breakage of a thin nail, implant migration before union, and painful prominent hardware and ulnar bursitis. So with the newer nails, interlocking capability and enhanced anti-rotational stability, rates are reported their union rate is as equal as the plating and there is a distinct advantage prevent shortening in metaphyseal comminuted and segmental diaphyseal fractions of the forearm. So this year the literature also says that the two fixation methods yield similar results in the terms of functional healing and patient satisfaction in the management of adult forearm fractures. Interlock nailing is a technically demanding procedure and probably it's not very available in the Indian market. And when you do a proximal locking, there is always a chance of injuring the posterior interosseous nerve. So therefore, I designed a new concept in the treatment of the forearm fracture with the screw intramodulary nail. This paper is already published in Indian Journal of Orthopedic. A biological method of forearm fracture by screw intramodulary nail. The results are compared to the plating. You also make your choice for nailing in the next state today itself. I assure you, you shall never regret. The screw nail or thalam nail available in diameter of 2 to 0.53 mm, variable length, titanium or steel, a threaded head at the end of the nail, self cutting thread to be screwed with the screwdriver. Screw head is placed at the end of the bone to prevent migration. And it is an elastic nail 
rigid enough to withstand the torsional rotational angular forces and it finally sits back springs back to prevent a, uh, to achieve the radial bow so this is an example of a restoration of a radial bow by im nail so there is only a one uh, sentence it is written that you cannot achieve a radial bow by nailing but you can see if you use the use of a principles of elastic nailing and you will be able to restore the radial bow so how i had do it bowing of the radius can be achieved by proper contouring of the nail the insertion should firmly grab the nail in order to control the insertion and nail withdrawal and in alna i mostly do a rim nailing because thick rim nail gives a better stability this is manual traction or you can use a ready made distractor of a forearm so that the reduction can be achieved close method mostly k wire assisted reduction you can use in there is a translation of the fragment and 10 to 15% may require a mini open reduction to achieve a perfect reduction this is ulnar nail entry tip of the trochanter with the help of a steel pin or bone hole and then you have to increase uh, this is the video you can see how i do it and you can see this is the proximal entry and then widening of the entry with the straight hole and then you have to do a, a rimming of the canal is the most important because it helps in giving you a a very press fit nail inside and k wire assisted reduction we have to achieve the reduction it helps that uh, rimming in the reduction also so these are the all you have to insert the nail and then last we have to spur threads are there in the metapisis and it achieves the bow of the bone because of the elasticity and it fits into the metapisis and in the radius nail identification of the entry point with the k wire window through the radial stylite between the tendon of the extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor pollicis brevis this is a bare area some arterial uh, tributaries are sometime injured but we can spare the superficial radial nerve blunt dissection and then with this you give a small incision and then a uh, bone hole is put inside the radial stylite process the entry point is uh, entry point is uh, dilated this is the most important step and then pass a nail uh, these are all images you can do a reaming sometime if it is possible it is possible to do a reaming also and because the most important is the negotiation through the radial growth so some bend is given and as soon as you go into the distal fragment this is a tricky and once that is a reduction achieved the radial bow automatically will come the nail was advanced with a smooth oscillating movement until the tip reaches to the proximal fragment of the metapisis and some light blow of hammers are required and you can see here this is how it is a k wire assisted stabilization and putting the nail inside so reduction reaming and then inside keeping the uh, this uh, screw rimmed nail in ulna mostly on limb in the radius bone so in nut cell procedure whichever the bone is first uh, gives a good reduction on radiological image nail that first and then with the k wire assisted translation of that a displaced fragment is done and the nailing preferably you will find the ulna comes very easily and the radius there is some translation which can be prevented and you can see here how the nailing is done by close method and in the disparate of the canal you can put a smaller nail which i will show you again and tractional ridge nail forwarded and you have to compress so that there should not be any distraction and the nail screw is fitted into the metapisis and here in the comminuted fracture it must reach to the subchondral bone so that there will be no collapse and this can be used in a comminuted fractures also so 
in a reduction nail, this is in disparity of the canal. And you can see here a small nail, another nail of a different size and length is passed across the fracture site into the middle end till further negotiation is not possible. And so the reduction nail and then it is a stabilizing nail. And this you can see here the video. You can see there how the translation is corrected in a disparity of the canal where here is the galagia right fracture. So disparity on a canal, you can use a two nails. So this is an example. You can see a stack nailing and one year follow-up, there is a complete restoration of the radial bow, displaced fracture, stack nailing in osteoporotic bone, and it is completely and mostly closed for 10 to 15%. They require a open reduction, above elbow cast, above elbow 90 degree flexion and forearm in neutral or supination for four to six weeks. And this you can see a very displaced, unstable, oblique type of a fracture. You can see there is always a translation, probably plating is good and how the perfectly achieved a reduction of this fracture. And this is the uh, fracture at the same level, unstable fracture, radiological and functional outcome, a stitchless surgery. Another example, fracture at the same layer, proximal third, most unstable fracture. This method prevents injury to the posterior interosseous nerve. It is a common to observe while doing a plating and interlock kneeling. Very distal fracture, nailing, middle third. I can show you innumerable examples where it can be used in a proximal, distal, midital, comminuted fracture and perfect anatomical restoration with the two stack nails. And this is another example, most displaced fracture, fracture uh, close method, three years of follow-up, this radial bow is also maintained. Another fracture, a proximal fracture where plating is indicated, you can see here, the stack nailing has given a perfect result. Inferior radial nerve displaced, distal port fracture, plating is an ideal, but how the stack nailing has given and, and uh, this radial bow is uh, restored. He is 110 Sandeep Jain, a very big man here. And you can see here how this has been done. Another example, a comminuted fracture, if you place the screw in the metaphysis and a, a, in the subchondral bone, the length is achieved. And in comminuted fracture, if the length is maintained, and the fracture is left closed, the bone grafting is not necessary and fracture heals around the nail. Another example, a comminuted fracture you can see here, and I think a single nailing has given and restored the leg and it has healed. So another example, the revision surgery after plate failure, did the nailing restore the leg and bone grafting and patient had a perfect anatomical restoration. Another example where the plating has failed, did a stack nailing with bone grafting and everything healed. Another example, a single isolated fracture and segmental fracture of the ulna. This is one of the best method you can perform by close method without giving any soft tissue trouble. Another example, a radius comminuted fracture, the length is maintained, you can see here. There is nothing like that the nailing is contraindicated in comminuted fracture. We have to maintain the length and the nail should be placed in the subcontinental bone. And you can see here how a transfer fracture, comminuted fracture of a radius close. So nailing against nailing plasters causes permanent stiffness of the joint. It's a myth. An uninjured joint never gets stiff if immobilized up to six weeks in any part of a splint or a plaster. Jan Chanle. Another incomplete reduction and produce a distraction of the other bone. Alna is a relatively straight bone, so no issue of nailing. Simple principle, three-point fixation, thicker rim nail to prevent back out. Problem is with the radius to restore the radial bow. This is one of the most important issue. 
and how to reduce uh, uh, this restore the radial bone. So eccentric entry point, use a pre-bent bell to restore the radial bow. In clinical practice, it is rarely observed, but with the careful thumping and compression distraction can be reduced. And more it is an issue in the, uh, the Galagia type of varoid fracture, but where that also we can achieve it. Another example, you can see here, the one bone is uniting, another bone is translated. So what I did, just a supplementary, yeah, a additional plate has given a perfect anatomical restoration. These are some loss of radial bow to restriction of rotation of the forearm. That is the uh, nailing against, and you can see there is a complex curvatures of the uh, these forearm bones, and they are very difficult even to match with the plate also, though people say that the plating is superior union but radial bow restoration is not even always possible by plate also. So myth, good union and full function at the four month. Another example, you can see no function and it's a very unstable fracture, inferior radial nerve displaced, segmental fracture, did a close nailing and it is a functional outcome. Another example, this is all segmental radius with ulna fracture with inferior nerve dislocated, close technique, one month follow up, six month follow up after 12 months. Though there is a, some anatomical variation, some inferior radial joint disparity is seen, but you can see the functional results. So in general observation, some terminal RMO may be lost, especially supination of fora, but the majority work which can be performed without full supination and over the period they compensate. How the compensation occurs, you can see here, the terminal loss of RMO, but no problem to the patient in this case. And you can see here, this proposition, when both forearm bones are fractured, if the radial bow is lost, the ulna and shoulder probably adults that will allow the full rotation. In isolated radial fracture, it is probably the more important to retain the radial bow. And this is the crux here in the so how it compensate, I think so. And you can see this is how a video is there. And this is how a, how compensation, compensation occurs at the elbow and shoulder, which is even not visible when you do a nailing and in a functional impairment. So these are all, nothing always works. Highly comminuted fracture, fracture at the ends of the bone, a narrow canal. Conversion to plate in a low gallagher fracture on table may require in 15 to 20% of the patient. So in some of the cases, if you are not able to do a nailing on table and you are not achieving restoration of the bow or anatomical restoration, then probably you can switch out to the plate. So whenever you do a nailing, please keep both the systems on table. Non-union of a radius fracture, here you can see a thin nail, some translation and ultimately it was revised with the plate and bone grafting. So literature grossly inadequate. Even Google and PubMed, they are uh, showing only very few references regarding the nailing in adult forearm fractures. Meticulous record of operated patient by me is the Google and PubMed for me. And to tell you very frankly, in my observation, nailing works wonder of the whatever the literature and practice says. So in conclusion, intramodary nailing of adult forearm diaphyseal fever appears to be a good alternative to plate osteosis. These are all now recent literatures are coming up in favor of the nailing. Mini invasive surgery, you decide yourself what you want a mini invasive surgery, yeah, open scar like this, a surgery, it's your choice. I have no objection for those who are doing a routinely plating. So I see yours. Advantages of intraportin nail, three-point fixation of elastic nail, implant stress sharing behavior, which leads to secondary periosteal callus formation. No chances of refracture, mostly a scarless cosmetic surgery. Implant migration, prevented as screw fits into the metaphysis of radiation ulna 
and you can see here how it's a very unstable fracture, both bone forearm fracture, comminuted pieces. You can see length is maintained, perfect placement of the nail, restoration of this, and a perfect anatomical restoration with a good callus formation in a comminuted fracture, most uh, unstable fracture of the forearm fracture. Another example, comminuted fracture, if you restore the bow, and within three months, you can see everything is gluing. Uh, no contraindication if nailing uh, in a comminuted fracture, if the length is maintained and both ends are securely fixed and adequate immobilization for four to six weeks. Bilateral fracture, both unstable galagia and you can see a galagia variant. You can see here how it is a very displaced fracture and very near the fracture. So recently done this case and young engineer, only after three months a functional outcome, though the fracture is still yet to unite, but there is no pain and he has resumed duty a scarless, stitchless surgery. So take home message. Past is the plaster, present is the plate, and I believe that future will be a close intramodulary nailing, and I request you all, you try for surgeries and art, and you learn the technique of doing a minimal invasive scarless surgery in the next patient. Thanks to all my forearm nailing participants. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Thank you. for a very convincing presentation. Amazing on a forearm uh, nailing procedure and uh, um, you have convinced all of us that nailing does give a <laughs> lot of good results. Uh, the only problem of radial bow, even though if it is lost, still patient has a good retained function. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, I, sir, I, one, one, one query, sir. Can yeah. I ask? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Sir, Dr. Gardbune, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, in close nailing, how you decide the size uh, which uh, you want to put the nail inside the radius? Our radius, mostly it is 2.5 nail. Mostly, the, what we have to do, it's like a sounding. First, you plast, try to see on the image, I have a CR, and then yes. you get guess a guess. But in the ulna, it is perfectly, you can guess. In radius, it is a little bit difficult. But majority of the cases, 2.5 nail is enough. Please unshare so that we can have a discussion on Zoom. Dr. Gadevane. Yes, sir. Uh, in the last case, we have a feeling where the alna was protruding out dorsally very much. So, what when you do nailing, why you do, do you do something to that or just leave it like that? No, no. Sometimes it is possible that we have to revise it so if it is so painful to the patient. You can but, revise it. No, no. At that time when you are nailing the radius, do you do something to distal radio on the joint or not? Distal radio joint, if it is subluxated after doing a restoring anatomy also, then you can use a K-wire fixation, transfixing from ulna to radius for at least uh, three weeks. At which position of the forearm? Uh, in, in full supineness. Dr. Patinkar, by that time, you can share your screen, please. No, I wanted to just comment. Yeah. Uh, the, and Dr. Gadegone has always mentioned, or was mentioning quite often, that he is having, a, if at all, there is a problem with maintaining the radial bow. Gadegone, sir, please stop share. Uh, that is what I am doing. Yes. Yeah. So, Dr. Gadegone was mentioning that he is having a problem occasionally with maintaining the radial bow. Uh, in my limited experience of uh, forearm nailing, I find that if you nail it, if you insert the nail from the uh, Lister's tubercle, the radius bow, radial bow is maintained much better as compared to if you insert it from the radial styloid. What is your opinion? I do agree. In the near the, the fracture near the wrist, they do uh, the Lister tubercle um, is the best entry point. For diphyseal and above, you can use a a styloid process. I think you should, uh, we should study the fracture pattern of the radius also. Yes. When we are doing uh, the nailing and for uh, entering at the Lister tubercle, I find that take a formal incision 
and retract the uh, extensive policies longer on the lateral side and there will be no problem if you do it blindly your epl is going to give you a lot of trouble or it may uh, have a rupture also no no i don't do it blindly i give a incision this yes. with the artery force bluntly reach to the bone and then and then your owl is passed not a blind i would i would suggest that you should retract the epl on the lateral side okay so uh, dr patnagar sir can you dr share? dr god gone sir yes sir sir dr god gone yeah uh, please go ahead ask your question done first which nail Allah should be uh, yeah which is first and uh, sir then plating sir we always try okay yeah so uh, we'll start with the lecture of dr patankar sir patankar sir please go ahead yeah uh, am i visible and audible yeah yes, yeah sir. perfect yes yes uh, thank you uh, dr chandak uh, and uh, ioa for allowing me to share my experiences on uh, techniques of fixation of the uh, metacarpal and phalangeal fra fractures by intramedullary wires actually there is no difference between the nails and wires only uh, probably we call the thinner nails as wires i think about up to 1.5 we may label them as wires otherwise they can all be because uh, dr gardingone is using 2.5 so he calls it nails so i think there is a very thin line of difference but a thinner the implant i think it's better to be uh, labeled as wires secondly wires, wires can be coiled Is yeah wires can be coiled actually actually that is the you use electrical wires that is the term so they are coiled but i think a thinner nail can be termed as wire for the purpose of this lecture and discussion okay thank you uh we have also heard of dr uh, thakkar um, giving a lecture on the condylocephalic uh, nailing and dr uh, gadegon is also uh, uh, has mentioned three point fixation i think both these terms are very useful as far as hand is concerned and these are useful in the metacarpals proximal phalanges and the middle phalanx these principles so uh, intramedullary wires are most useful for metacarpal fractures in the neck distal shaft and comminuted shaft fractures with some modifications in the proximal phalanx they can be used and uh, for the neck and distal shaft fractures and in the proximal shaft fractures probably a retrograde nailing and in the middle phalanx also i have used them and i have described a method in the general hand surgery for the neck and distal shaft so we go to metacarpal neck fractures this was the commonly the nailing which uh, wiring we which you see or which uh, we wish to see uh, that is a retrograde wiring this is a very simple uh, method proposed uh, purportedly but there are various or lot of complications of this especially extensor tendon tethering and uh, stiffness of the mp joints which results in poor function of the hand ultimately the fracture will always heal in spite of the surgeon so these are the options which we used to see for metacarpal uh, neck fractures and this is the option which we commonly use for distal shaft and the neck fractures and that is the flexible anti grade intramedullary wiring for metacarpal neck fractures this is an adaptation described by gi fushe who uh, saw the enders nailing in 1970 and he adapted it and uh, published it in 1976 and called it as the bouquet technique this is basically a technique uh, described if close reduction is possible for which i think an early presentation is important for the patient he should present in at such a time that close reduction of the fracture can be possible and it is very well uh, done and very well uh, very good results are achieved if you have a transverse and short oblique fracture obviously these fractures uh, have to be extra articular for this method to succeed the entry point is very important for metacarpals 
in such a way that one should not hurt the extensor tendons as they are passing through the uh, towards the uh, second to fifth metacarpal. So this diagram is very important. One must note that these are the preferred entry points. Of course, the fracture pattern may uh, allow us or may need that the entry point sh should be changed. In that, in that condition, the uh, entry point, uh, the incision has to be taken. The extensor tendon has to be properly retracted and ensured that it does not uh, suffer from attrition rupture. And then the proper entry point has to be taken. Commonly, a metacarpal neck fracture will present with uh, not only angulation, there is significant volar combination. So this has to be taken care of or must be remembered while we are doing a uh, anti-grade nailing, uh, anti-grade wiring of the metacarpal neck fractures. And this is the bouquet technique uh, or the example of a bouquet technique described. After close reduction, we achieve this. The wires are spread apart in the uh, distal fragment or in the head. So it's a minimally invasive extraarticular method. The reduction is quite simple as far as uh, metacarpal neck fractures, but the fixation is complex. Why it is complex? Because the wires have to be seated in different quadrants of the head, for which they have to be the distal ends of the wires have to be bent uh, to various degrees, 30 to 45 degrees. The maintenance of the reduction depends on the wire rotation in the particular fragments. Beware of the hidden intraarticular extensions. In spite of taking multiple X-rays, sometimes there are intraarticular extensions which can be missed, and the wires can penetrate, penetrate through that into the joint. And in the metacarpal, the biggest problem is that the lateral view is very difficult to interpret because of overlap. So you have to depend on supine oblique and prone oblique views and get an idea of the uh, proper reduction and proper wire placement. So this is the same case, the index case. This is the uh, X-ray at 40 weeks. This was a doctor. And that is the function at 40 weeks. And as you can see, a minimally invasive technique, a very small incision has been taken, no scar problems, and very good function. So these, the steps of the anti-grade intramillary K-wire fixation for metacarpal neck fractures, obviously after close reduction, are available on this YouTube link. Uh, the lecture would have extended too much if I had shown this video. So I, all of you can see this on the YouTube at this link. So for this uh, technique, the most important tools are a small T handle a wire bender and a K-wire cutter. And the wire size recommended is depending on the bone that we are uh, involved or uh, bone we are fixing. Uh, generally for middle phalanx, it is 0.8. Uh, uh, for middle phalanx, it is 0.8 millimeters. For proximal phalanx, it is 1 millimeter. And for metacarpus, you can go up to 1.2, but uh, multiple wires of one, one millimeter are also good enough. You study now, this is another case. In this, we should, all, in every case of a metacarpal neck fracture, we should study the X-ray in detail. This is a case of a comminuted uh, fracture of the neck of the fifth metacarpal. If you study the X-ray in detail, you find that there is a combination at the side. The head per se is intact, but there is a combination. So if you are not careful, of the way to in, uh, insert the wire, then you may uh, end up in uh, at the fracture site. So this is the X-ray at three months post-op. And you can see a, a very good example of a segmental fixation with joint sparing. This is the function at three months. And this is three years post-op. You can see the nail has neither migrated proximally or distally. And which restores the knuckle. It's a tendon sparing surgery and joint sparing surgery. So this is another case where the surgeon probably got misled. Lateral view, as I mentioned, is useless in metacarpal neck fractures. It's very difficult to interpret. So this was a case where percutaneous fixation was attempted. And you can see the wires are kept outside. I think percutaneous fixation was attempted from the distal end also, and we did not succeed. And the patient landed up in problems. These are two thick wires uh, used. It should not be done. And again, volar slab should not be done. It causes MP joint stiffness. So this fixation was revised and converted into an anti-grade intramural fixation. You can again see the bouquet effect 
that is that wires are spreading apart into the various segments of the head and gives rise to gives a very good function here so for metacarpal shaft fractures uh, you can use this method for transfer short oblique fractures and uh, you can also use it for long oblique and spiral fractures and comminuted fractures with some modifications which i'll show you for metacarpal shaft fractures they are always uh, they are always uh, angulated with apex dorsal the reduction is quite difficult because you have to match this small two diameters here but the fixation is simple after you get the close reduction all you can do is there is no need to pass multiple nails you can use a single wire also of a proper diameter and you can use this is an internal splint basically so here two thin wires were used and here you can see that the you can see the stability is so much that you can see uh, early callus was seen at two weeks in this case and that's the function at three months post-op there is no extensor lag in this case uh, for people who are not used to this method i would recommend that one should start with the fifth metacarpal that's the simplest bone to uh, operate and uh, this was a case of multiple sharp fractures. This was an ATV accident, a young lady with multiple abrasions, multiple other problems. This was a case where there are three metacarpal sharp fractures and oh, the reduction was done closed, but to ensure that the extensor tendon does not uh, suffer any damage, the extensor were identified through a long incision and a single wire was passed through uh, into all the three metacarpals. And that is the uh, result at six months post-op. This was again a tendon sparing, joint sparing surgery. And uh, she developed MP joint stiffness because of the multiple injuries and treated with splints. And you can see even at the six months, she has got very good function. And this is at three years post-op. She's got normal function of the hand. So for comminuted shaft fractures and oblique fractures, uh, the currently the low profile plates and screws are in vogue the ao and martin has got very good options for this but you can also treat it with uh, locking uh, nails or locking wires as i have described in uh, 2011 this paper this was a uh, case of a comminuted fracture of the fourth metacarpal which was treated with closed reduction and locked intermediary wiring you can see that this is a minimal access surgery and this after the surgery we give an early assisted mobilization in form of strapping and the fracture heals there is no collapse because of this proximal lock the distal lock is provided by this blunt wire uh, in uh, engaging into the intact head and that's the functional recovery and obviously in these cases because of the uh, this uh, lock is protruding through the skin this has to be removed. All the implants have to be removed in this case. Other cases, there is no need to remove the implants. So we go on to cases of fractures of the proximal phalanx. As you can see, the fracture of the proximal phalanx is closely related to the flexor tendons neurovascular bundle. And the proximal phalanx are surrounded by the extensor apparatus, especially in this proximal two-thirds. So one has to be very careful when you do a closed wiring so as not to hurt the extensor tendons. And uh, obviously, we must get a close reduction. So these are the examples of uh, failed closed intramedullary or closed wiring, where it resulted in myelinion, nonunion, joint stiffness, and tendon impalement. So these are uh, examples of what is not to be done. The aims, like in a metacarpal, is to achieve a stable fixation, anatomic reductions, tend it should be joint and tendon sparing, and permit early mobilization. If you leave them alone, if this uh, shaft of the proximal phalanges or the distal end, then they always have an apex volar angulation, which causes flexor tendon adhesions and PIP joint flexion contractures eventually. So this technique works, the integrated intermediary wiring, it works best in fractures of the distal shaft and neck. And the technique described by Guy Fouché in 1976 for metacarpal necks was described by Gonzalez and uh, Ingram and Hall in 1995. And they used very thin 0.8 millimeter wires in this. And this was a case of a distal end of the proximal phalanx, uh, distal shaft, I would say, who presented 10 days post-op. 
it was quite challenging. We presented with a grotesque deformity. It is a closed injury. So here uh, I uh, decided to go in for a closed nailing. But the challenge was to get a close reduction of this case. You can see a, uh, some combination also. So under NSC, a sustained traction was given. And a liberal incision was taken at the base of the proximal phalanx. You identify the extensor tendon. And, and the extensor tendon is split in the midline here. The reason the midline split is the safest split uh, in an extensor tendon, especially when you're dealing with fractures of the proximal phalanx and the uh, middle phalanx. There is no bare area in, in these two bones. So you have to, uh, uh, I would say, touch the extensor tendon at a place where it causes the least damage. So here, the bone entry is taken about 5 millimeter distal to the uh, uh, MP joint line. In a metacarpal, the bone entry is about 8 millimeters distal to the CMC joint. So not more than 1 millimeter wires, definitely in a proximal phalanx, ideally 0.8 millimeter wires. They should be pre-bent blunt wires. The extensor, the uh, split in the extensor tendon is uh, retracted with blunt skin hooks. And after you uh, insert the wires, you should use or invest, I would say, in a sharp cutter, which will cut the wires as close to the bone as possible. And then the tendon is sutured over that. So these are the steps of the same case. The entry hole is 5 millimeters distal to the MP joint. You locate the intermediate canal with a blunt wire. And these are all the steps which are seen in the metacarpal video also. And then a 1 millimeter wire is used and uh, the, it is uh, uh, pushed up to the fracture site. Once you reach the fracture site, the wire is rotated because if you continue in this same direction, the wire will go out of the fracture site. So the wire is rotated at the fracture site and then advanced across the fracture and that is the final seating of the wire. So this is the pre-op. The wires are cut uh, close to bone. You can see that the wires in a metaca, in a proximal phalanx, there is not too much place in the distal shaft and the neck to rotate the wires. So you can just try to get them as uh, wide apart or as uh, the, the, their end should be apart as much as possible, but not, uh, not it is not possible as much as in, in a metacarpal neck. So the wires are cut close to the bone and the, you should always use multiple wires. You can use multiple wires. If you are using thin wires, you can definitely use multiple wires. As you can see, they are cut close to the bone and they are away from the joint. So we go to the three-point fixation principle, which is easily seen in, a, in the lateral view. So that's why I've demonstrated in the proximal phalanx. This is the same example. This is the pre-op and you can see the wires are inserted in the three-point fixation. What does it mean? It means that the K-wire abuts the intact cortex in the near fragment. And the near means near to the entry point. So you, if you go retrograde, then the near cortex is in the uh, far end of the bone. So this is the entry point. These are the places where the wires are abutting. If, that means that if the fracture is at this place, you cannot use this method. Because the wire, if it, if it abuts here, then and then only the second point of fixation is in the near or close to the, in the proximal fragment. And then the third uh, point is in this uh, distal fragment. So this is the three point fi uh, fixation principle. So this was the same case. This is three years post-op. You can see a perfect healing of this uh, fracture. The wires are not hurting the tendon and nowhere near the joint. And that is the uh, magnification. And that is the three-point fixation. And you can see an excellent result because the three-point fixation has been followed. And that is the function. Now you can see this example where uh, by uh, as an error, I'm showing you this case. This was the uh, entry point. And the second point of fixation is in the far fragment. So this three-point fixation is not served in this principle. And that's why the fracture is getting displaced. So probably another method of fixation or a retrograde method of fix uh, nailing or wiring should have been done in this case. So you can see that a fracture is dislodged because proper attention to detail was not given in this case. So a fracture of the neck, you can go as far as the neck of the proximal phalanx. 
provided the fracture is extra articular. So you can do this method, you can use this method if the fracture is extra articular. Make sure that you see the X-ray properly and see that the fracture is extra articular. And that is the result at two years post-op. And you can see an excellent function. You can see in spite of extensive split, in spite of keeping the wire inside, there is no problem with these wires. So now this is the case where the fracture is in the uh, proximal to the mid shaft of the bone. So here a proximal nailing or anti-grade nailing cannot be done. So here a retrograde wiring has to be done. This patient presented late. So an extensive split was the used approach to open reduction was done. And then the wires were inserted from the distal side. That's how you should remember while you're doing a retrograde wiring at that the base of the proximal phalanx is, uh, there is a lot of place on the volar side of the proximal phalanx. So the wire has to be directed in such a way that it goes on the volar side here like this, like this. So this will give a proper three-point fixation. In spite of the open reduction, the wire has, cannot be cut very close. So these wires eventually have to be removed in a retrograde wiring. So this is a two years post-op. That's another case where there is a combination. However, with the proper attention to the X-ray, you can see that there is a obliquity of the fracture. So obviously you cannot go, you cannot enter from this side, from the medial side. So you have to enter from the radial side. So a single wire, a properly bent wire, properly directed wire could hold this fracture very properly. And you can see the wire is going on the, uh, or passing from the distal side, going proximally and entering on the volar side here. And assisted mobilization can be done immediately in this case. And that is the fracture which is uniting you can see callus. And that is the function. Obviously, this function is of the PIP joint is not complete because the wire is still there. And the wire has to be removed here. And that's the fracture which is completely healed. And that is the function after one year. So this is an example uh, which was done by me. This was a case of multiple fractures done by me 14 years ago. And the wires are still on. All the wires are still there. No, no, none of the wires has become loose. The patient is not having any advantageous bursitis. That's because the wires are cut very flush. And here we have used a modification. We have used the wires in a hairpin manner, which was eventually described by me 10 years ago, this paper in another case. And the principle that we have used is of these quarter pins that are available with these uh, mechanics and the car repairers. So the same principle was used of these quarter pins. You can see this, the, these wires are bent like a hairpin. So they spread in, uh, inside and they give you a perfect uh, or very good fixation on the proximal half. So that is the function at 14 years. And now the last part of the lecture, a uh, small, uh, small talk here, uh, fractures of the middle phalanx. The same method of the met metacarpal proximal phalanx was modified by me and uh, used for fixation of the middle phalanger fracture. This was a case of a human bite, where in addition to the fracture, the human bite, the teeth have caused the fracture of the middle phalanx in addition to the fingertip injury. So that was the displaced fracture of the middle phalanx and there was a tough or the fingertip injury here also. So after waiting for the proper antibiotics and debridement because it's a human bite, then we did this. Then I went and uh, this was the multiple steps here, a five millimeter uh, distilled to the uh, PIP joint. You enter the wire, uh, enter the uh, K wire here. That's uh, used as an owl. About 1.5 or 2 millimeter wire can be used depending on how many wires you want to use. And the intramedial canal is found here. And again, you can see the three point fixation, the entry point and the uh, second uh, abutment is on the same fragment. And then you can uh, insert the wire into the distal fragment here. So you can see that the wire is gone like this. And then you do the close reduction. And this is a 0.8 millimeter wire. And you reduce the fracture on that. And this is the first wire that is passed. And that's the second wire which is passed. The, you can manually collapse the fracture. The wire is cut flush. You can see that the PIP joint function will not get restricted because the wire is cut flush with the bone. And that's the function. That's the fracture that is completely healed. And that's the function of the hand. This is another case seemingly impossible to treat with these intramedial wires. 
but with sustained traction if the traction is not possible if you feel that your fingers cannot pull this small piece of bone over the distal phalanx you can insert a transverse k wire here 1.5 in, in uh, give manual traction onto that and then reduce the fracture and that is the fixation achieved with this 2.8 mm wires and that is the function at one year post op so this method for the anti grade intramural wiring for middle phalanger fractures were discovered by me in 2014 and is published in this journal general hand surgery american and that's another case which was which presented to me with a fracture of the middle phalanx where the retrograde 2 mm wire was inserted and that patient went on to to stiffness and a non union of the middle phalanx here so this was treated by removal of that wire and inserting this hairpin wire which held on to this fracture gave a very stable fixation and resulted in union and uh, at one year and that is the function of the patient at one year this was described by me in 2013 in this journal of hands in hand surgery journal that's published from singapore so take home messages in this lecture and that this methods is a uh, flexible wiring is very good for transverse or spiral oblique fractures provided they are distal uh, to the mid shaft and they should be extra articular this method works well if you uh, achieve a close reduction for which early presentation is important use thin wires nothing more than 1.2 mm wire should be used preferably 1 mm or 0.8 uh, due to which you can use multiple wires you can get more stability in that way preferably go anti grade this method is joint sparing tendon sparing fixation which gives three point fixation cutting the wires close to bone requires a very good cutter keep on changing the cutter and that will not cause any problems retrograde wires can cause joint stiffness but it works very well in proximal fractures i thank you all for your attention thank you very much uh, patnika sir that was a wonderful comprehensive lecture on management of this tough injuries uh, can i ask you how do you uh, get those non sharp wires uh, what is your source oh that sure source is you uh, buy the prop, uh, buy the routine kevars and cut their ends okay but then the cut ends are sharp actually they are not smooth no, cut ends are rough they are not sharp and oh. that is what is what is required actually that the rough end they are not pointed they are not blunt but the the rough end is the one which holds into the lattice work of the or lattice uh bone structure of the uh, metacarpal heads or the proximal phalangeal heads okay so you are just cutting them you are just cut them okay but then do you remove these wires afterwards never you can see a 14 year example they don't they don't require to be removed if you cut them flush with the bone and if your insertion is proper entry point is proper there is no need to remove them um patan kar sir where do you get your cutter from the lohar chal lohar <laughs> okay so thank you very much patankar sir it is always Thanks, a, uh, excellent uh, to hear you and um, i uh, invite asim negi for uh, uh, next lecture good afternoon sir good afternoon welcome go ahead sir most important lecture is awaited of dr chander where infection is yes. so in situation so we'll hear the infection after this aseptic non union infected non union friends if i tell you that forearm is a complex joint don't be surprised fracture of the radius ulna is actually not a diffuse fracture it's a complex intraarticular fracture involving six joints from elbow to wrist as you can see in this drawing there incidence of non union is 2 to 10% not very high but when it occurs is severely disabling because the dysfunction extends to elbow and wrist and it limits the ability of the person to place his hand in space treatment is difficult because as such you have got very poor bone mass in forearm bones and presence of previous implants makes placing new hardware even more difficult and there can be issues with joint stiffness of elbow and wrist because of the prolonged immobilization we all know that a fracture by definition is labeled as non union when it has not healed in 6 months 
there is no progression of healing seen on x-rays in three months and there is no chance of healing without additional operation as you can see in the case on the right side causes can be mechanical quite often many of us are pl placing plates which are too short or too weak so that they bend before the fracture consolidates or there is outright mal reduction as you can see in these two cases shown below causes can be biological local causes like bone loss in an open fracture a segmental or a severely comminuted fracture with poor soft tissue cover after high velocity injury infection pathological fractures after tumor and other metabolic things or post radiation fractures systemic causes like diabetes smoking and vitamin d deficiency can all predispose a patient for non union non union leads to shortening angulation loss of radial bow and consequently loss of motion and function for treatment of aseptic forearm non union compression plate and autogenous bone graft is the gold standard a review of literature will tell us that 80 to 90% patients will get good to excellent outcome only 5 to 10% get poor results a defect less than 6 cm can be bridged with autogenous cancellous bone graft i often use chip grafts as shown on the left rarely a block graft shown on the right defect of more than 6 cm can be bridged with autologous fibula as we did for this patient shown on your right side if osteocutaneous free vascularized fibular graft has very high success rate but has far more donor side morbidity you need microsurgical expertise and there is slightly increased risk of infection as we did for the 60 year old female in which there was a 15 cm defect in ulna after excision of a tumor which was pressed with free vascularized fibula hypertrophic non union they require only compression plating you require you are needed to remove the callus to position the plate fully and you can use callus as bone graft baldini showed that allograft is as good as autograft we will use some of these principles in treating the 16 year old who was plated like this and and at 10 weeks his x ray shows that there is no compression achieved at radius or ulna radius has significant rotational pronation mal alignment and there is lysis seen around all the screw holes yet people waited 14 weeks plate has bent eight months he has pain limitation of range of motion that's his dominant hand he cannot write down his papers or play fortunately for us there is no infection we decided to revise it you can expose the entire radius by anterior approach keep the widest possible bridge between radius and ulna you can see the artery and the superficial branch of radial now in the dissection there do a z tenotomy of pronate teres raise good osteoperiosteal flaps with muscles attached take out your hardware expose the fracture ends and open the medullary canal proximally as well as distally with 1.5 mm k wire but do not perforate the cortex note that this radius is obviously fixed in pronation expose the interosseal border of radius and correct all the rotational mal alignment precisely i tend to place my radial plate on the anterolateral surface which makes it easy to restore the radial bro uh, radial bow nice good compression achieved at radius and at the end you repair the pronated teres we chose a 12 hole long lcp to bypass holes due to previous fixation in this patient it's very obvious that radius is anatomically reduced and well compressed using cortical screws shown by the arrow so we achieved absolute stability in radius to maintain the normal radio ulna variance ulna will obviously have a gap don't worry about that and the plate is buried well within the bone rest the osteoperiosteal flaps to remove the hardware don't forget to send the material for culture and sensitivity from the medullary canal online method is balloon is deformed it has many holes of previous fixation just bypass them by using a 16 hole locking plate and this 16 hole bridge plate offers relative stability but yields union get at least four screws in normal ulna proximally and distally use allograft to pack the void in the method of ulna you can see how much of the graft has been packed there as his immediate post op and 7 months back he has got an excellent function is back playing cricket 
something in his landmark paper spanned over 33 years, treated 47 patients, 80% had good to excellent results. 20% of the poor results were attributable to mostly stiff wrist and one patient had a stiff elbow. They also showed that diaphyseal non-unions give better results than proximal ulna and distal radius non-union, probably because PRUJ and DRUJ are less affected. Let's see some case scenarios. 26-year male, two-year postdoc has significant limitation of function, treated like this, he had some pain also. His other forearm also is treated the same way, but he's not complaining much on that side. Hardware removed, volar approach, mobilize the non-union and correct the deformity. Pre-stress your plate at the fracture site as shown by a yellow arrow and contour the plate as shown by the green arrow in the distal part to accommodate the concavity of distal part of radius. Plate it, draft it, and four weeks the K-wire goes out and one year fracture has united with full recovery of function. Another 33-year-old, Surgeon treated him like this. This fracture treated like this. Later on, he realized that DRUJ was dislocated. So he added simply two K wires, but joint is still dislocated and radius is short and deformed. Eight months, he has significant limitation of supination. Our options were you can do the radial lengthening and, or ulnar shortening. Unlike humerus, the forearm bones, they do not tolerate significant shortening without loss of hand function. So we decided to lengthen the radius. That's the opposite side forearm X-ray. Factor was mobilized and distracted using a cervical interbody distractor to restore the radio ulnar variance, which has to be checked repeatedly. Don't be happy with what you are seeing on the screen. It still needs little more lengthening. Do that, and once you achieve perfect variance, hold it with a K wire and plate it. Pack the graft with oh, autogenous cancellous graft. Friends, DRUJ will usually reduce when bone injury is perfectly reduced and fixed well. And that's his four-year follow-up. You can see that his all smiles. 15-year-old girl, immediate post-op. Surgeon just forgot to treat the distal radius fracture. Two months, unfortunately, Alna got infected. So he removed the Alna. The distal radius is still unattended. At this stage, I took over the patient. We controlled the infection and then later on did distal radius osteotomy, corrective osteotomy, plated both the bones. And this is her 16-year follow-up. She is not normal, but she could carry on with her life without any discomfort, having good enough function. Friends, proximal ulna non-union, they are usually associated with complex fracture dislocation of the elbow. They end up with an apex posterior deformity with dislocation of head radius. This doctor was treated like this. Hardware was remo removed. We divided the non-union and regained the length of ulna, corrected the dorsal angulation. This plate should be placed on the dorsal surface, which is the tension site for ulna. Place the proximal screw shown by the red arrow orthogonal at 90 degree to the distal screws to get a rigid interlock construct, and you can mobilize almost immediately. And that's eight years follow-up, full return of function. The terminated upper third radius Alna fracture was nailed. There is no mechanical stability in this community fracture with this type of fixation. There was shortening, dorsal angulation, hardware was removed, and plating with bone grafting yielded an excellent function. My take home message is there is no role of MIS. Achieve stable anatomical reduction, preserving the biology. Longer plates with high plate and screw ratio, they are preferred. 90% patients can be treated with non locking plates. Realign your DREJ, assess with fluoro repeatedly and check rotations on table. Locking plates are mandatory to treat fractures with metaphyseal extension and for fixation into short proximal and distal fragments. Postoperatively, you have to really elevate them in the first few days to reduce the edema. Immobilize for minimum time required to protect the soft tissue, but mobilize as soon as possible. Dislocations may require immobilization for three to four weeks. Complications are soft tissue may fail to heal, infection because they are long surgeries. Synostosis can occur in less than 6%. You can have a persistent non-union and joint stiffness can be your bugbear. Don't think that a child cannot get non-union. They do get non-unions. You have to correct metabolic disorder. Follow the usual principles. However, 
rate of synostosis or myositis at ulna and elbow stiffness is slightly more in children, nine year old, conserved, then nailed like this. At six months, he had deformity, gross limitation of motion. Fitting was done. Callus was used as bone graft. Radio ulnar variance has been nicely restored. You can see that that's his three years follow up, and this is now almost 12 years. He has got a full return of function without any shortening. Another 15 year old, increasing deformity due to non union ulna post infection. But when I saw him, he had no active infection but a deformed, dysfunctional hand. We created it, and that's his three years follow up with good return of function. Another 26 year old, four months old, treated like this. Nail is buried deep within, located under image intensifier. Do an open removal of hardware. Protect the EPL tendon. Pass your plate through a tunnel in the pronator teres, as we have done in this case. Fracture reduced, plated well. That is immediate for post op. Four months fracture is healed. He also happened to have a very badly infected abony amputation, which had to be salvaged before doing this. And two years, he's back to his normal. He can drive a bike, he can do almost everything possible. There are alternative methods. Plate is not the only solution you can use intramedullary nails. And more so, once now interlock nails are available or the threaded nails are available, but commonly used nails, they do not give any rotational stability. They cause to tend to cause loss of radial bow and shortening, causing DREJ issues. However, you, you will find them useful in pediatric patients, patients with compromised soft tissue or patients with pathological fracture where you want to span the entire length of the bone. That can be easily done using a nail. This patient had a septic non-union. We converted it to a non-aseptic non-union. 11-year-old with chronic osteomyelitis of the ulna was having multiple surgeries, discharging sinuses and a scarred skin. Almost 90% of the ulna was sequestered and had to be removed. Antibiotic spacer there. Six weeks, we came back and spanned the gap using an autologous fibula. Only a thin pin was there with plaster and the fracture has healed at one year, two years, and that's his four-year follow-up. Absolutely normal function has come back. No infection. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Asim Nagib. That was a wonderful power pack lecture with a lot of knowledge and experience. With wonderful results. Thank you so much. Any questions to Dr. Nagib? Asim Nagib, sir, it is very difficult, yes, very difficult and challenging uh, the subject. You have made it so easy. And Asim I think, is, uh, presentation is more difficult. More difficult. It's and, more uh, difficult. That's the work. Worst case scenario. Hmm. So, so non, non union of need. Yeah, go ahead, sir. So, this is what you have to do this lecture. Ke liye. Thank you very much. And in the lecture, ke liye, uh, Evergreen uh, Dr. Chandak for infected non union. And uh, Goel, sir, uh, what is your comment regarding the lecture of uh, Ashim Negi? No, very, very nice. Very nice cases. Hmm. And he has. Uh, Done a wonderful job of and presented very well. Very nice. Thanks. I don't think we have to. Any question is there because uh, <laughs> everything was very clear. So, thank you, Gadigone, sir, for uh, allotting this topic of management of infected non union after forearm nailing or even after forearm plating. Uh, infection after nailing of forearm is fortunately less as compared to plate fixations. However, nail bursitis, irritational bursitis, nail prominence, they are very, very common. And when infection occurs, actually it is much worse than a plate infection. It occurs throughout the medullary cavity. Our aim of managing these cases, goal number one is to eradicate or to minimize or to control infection. Goal number two is to achieve union after we have eradicated or controlled infection. And goal number three is to give them uh, back their function because a lot of these hands are quite stiff and non-useful hands. So we have to give them function back. And nowadays, when we manage an infection, we are blessed with a lot of other things apart from routine debridement, which is the most essential thing in controlling of infection. 
However, we also can use antibiotic pouches, vacuum dressings, negative pressure, wound therapy, and certain of new dressing materials. Such severe infections need a lot of thinking, debridement, wash, lavage, negative pressure, wound therapy, and management in steps. That is one very crucial step in managing. And we have to identify the organism. And identifying the organism is critical in getting a good antibacterial coverage post-operatively. So usually I would like to seize all the antibiotic oral therapy which this patient keep on taking from various previous consultations or uh, from over the pharmacy. So we stop antibiotics so that we yield a good culture from the tissues in deep layers rather than the pus which is coming out from the sinus. Almost all of these infections in orthopedic are usually caused by biofilm forming bacteria and uh, they prevent antibacterial action. They do not allow opsonization and phagocytosis and therefore these infections are perpetual, chronic and usually do not yield to a simple antibacterial therapy. So when we take up this case, the most important thing is to remove all slough, um, necrotic bone uh, tissues which are uh, sloughing out, non-viable and dense tissues, etc. By the surgical and sharp dissection, we do have a lot of wash, lavage and we, we, we may use some tools to do a good defective um, tissues. This is a case. This patient presented almost a year after his nailing with fluoride infection and as you can see, this complete bone getting sequestrated, had a lot of pouring pus, discharge and he was managed with debridement, complete opening up of the uh, tissues on the ulna side, removing all the dead tissue, then providing a negative pressure wound therapy so that the infection and the tissues uh, develop good vascularity. And after the infection control, the antibiotic spacer was used in the defect. So this is a cylinder of antibiotic used in that space. Usually, we like to put this antibiotic spacer as a sort of a balen. So, it has a K wire inside on which uh, a cylinder of cement is there. So, we can put a small K wire inside and form an antibiotic of the same caliber of bone so that a soft tissue spacer is available. And this soft tissue spacer then is uh, available which, which can provide the same space as if when we are reconstructing the bone, that amount of space is available for putting the bone graft. These were the successive steps of management. So, removal of all dead tissue, providing spacer, giving negative pressure wound therapy. And once the tissues have healed, then taking an adequate iliac crest bone. And you need to choose the shape of iliac crest which mimics the shape. So in ulna, usually it is quite straight. In radius, it may have a small curvature. So I like to take the curvature and use the curvature of uh, the iliac crest for mimicking the shape of radius with a small bow. And in ulna, it can be a straight shape. So that spacer was provided. Since the patient was young and previous severe infection, I did not use a plate in this case. Just use a graft as a spacer enough distracted so that it was stable by itself and just a K wire to hold it in position and that healed very nicely giving a very useful function to the patient. This was a severe infection post-operative five months after his plate fixation and patient had two or three debridements prior to coming to us. However, with the retained implant, his infection was not settling down. So, he had a lot of infection, some loosening of the plate as well. So, we removed the plates, put this balen of antibiotic cement spacer, eluting good amount of antibiotic. So, this is what we are having a cement spacer. So, once the infection was controlled, this is how we put up the uh, cement, which mimics the size of that bone with a small K wire, which is going into the medullary cavity, a negative pressure wound therapy once or twice if required so that a good uh, vascular bed is created which takes up the graft at the end of around six weeks of masculine membrane. 
and once that is removed occasionally a hemi cylinder on the other side of the deeper side of the bone may be still viable so we may remove a hemi cylinder of bone which is necrotic under the plate remove that and then reconstruct it so nicely debride it the holes of screws is one difficult area to scoop out you need a specific scoop at that end very a very small one either you can scrape with a k wire or if you have a very small scoop available so we have a very small scoop which can go into the 3.5 hole created by the screw take it out remove everything get a vascular bed and then after um, the induction membrane when the wound seal completely then you can reconstruct the bone the way you would like either with a nail or a plate usually a plate with a antibiotic layer of cement onto the plate end so this was done with that and the patient's wound healed very nicely so this is a plate we like to put bone grafts in this space and occasionally if the infection is still not controlled at the end of 6 weeks a second debridement or we can use a layer of cement onto the plate so that it acts as a antibacterial eluting substance for a long long time and that patient healed very well so friends the treatment of infected non union follows a standard two stage procedure remove the infection control the infection with good antibiotic cement spacer which gives enough antibiotic locally so that a long 3 to 6 weeks of iv antibiotic is not required i will just use 5 days of intravenous antibiotic and no oral antibiotic after that just the cement itself eludes lot of good antibiotics and second stage we provide stability and bone graft and giving a good function to our patient thank you very much on this topic and the other topics we would have a discussion um uh, whatever are the questions please go ahead conduct your wonderful presentation and tips and tricks regarding a infected non union whether it is a forearm or any diaphyseal fractures of the uh, upper or lower extremity uh, i think uh, the principle remains the same but the in the forearm fracture uh, nobody talks of non union infected uh, very much on the platform academic and you have given the path for how the treatment should be carried out in a infected non union of the forearm fracture so goel sir, sir. goel sir uh, comment <laughs> for curating th those small holes what we get is a ent curate the yes. ent guys they use it for scraping the mastoid so it's very oh, yeah. strong but very very fine yes very fine they are essential most of the uh, cases which did not heal after removal of implant also i noticed lot of mug into those holes because this hole become from 3.5 to 4.5 and you are not able to go inside that should be curated very nicely or if you are requiring you can take out the superficial necrotic bone with a nibbler also yes do you do something to the medullary canal also yes so medullary yes. canal of forearm unfortunately cannot have a antibiotic cement nail but we can we can scrape it out basically those previous reamers can be utilized or long curates with a thin handle can be utilized but washing can be definitely done from the fracture end to the end of the bone you can wash them with a, a thin tubes yes that would be required plus uh, one more thing chandak sir uh, surgeon tends to in onco surgery the person who removes the tumor tissue is different and reconstructive surgery sometimes is different so that there is no hitch in dissecting the bone sometimes we are very miser in removing the dead necrotic bone that will never unite yes. that is the most important step probably yeah, yeah. so and as you rightly so showed even without a plate it healed because there were viable ends nice good cancellous graft and only k wire led to a healing in a very difficult situation that was magic so uh, basically good debridement is the key and nowadays with the availability of masculine two steps uh, i think that fear of the bone not taking up is gone with the good induction membrane even 5 cm 7 cm 10 cm graft can take up very well that has is a advantage nowadays so uh, with this i think we are coming towards the end of the webinar and i would uh, like our advisor uh, and uh, patron dr goel sir to sum up about various aspects of nailing in indian scenario its usefulness its uh, pros and cons of nailing procedures uh, for upper limb injuries
please sir as we saw and we discussed uh, usually the old dictum has been the plating for upper limb and nailing for lower limb because of weight bearing but uh, it all depends on circumstances and as uh, it was said in between you whatever you do you have to do it well so if you are doing nailing it, it must be done properly and well and if you are doing plating so even there is no point uh, no reason that nailing should not succeed all of us have done enough number of nailings and they do succeed the problem may occur sometime when the humerus is very thin you cannot lock it you cannot interrupt. but that is again the problem of uh, technique and uh, what the newer nails are coming but as shale showed uh, they are the very good nails uh, though at the moment the cost is the probably the main hindrance and i am sure very soon within a year or so we will be getting indian copies uh, which will be as good as uh, the original one like we have got for pfn and what dog proximal tbr plates and everything expert nail everything is copied so we will be getting it very soon i am sure and uh, then it will be a good thing uh, one thing is there in that shalish structure that it has it is most, almost always a open reduction of the fracture and a shalish Doctor Shalish, yes, in complex yes, three and three and four part, yes, sir. Because we need to get the tuberous studies back. So it should not be open be... reduction. So it should not be taken as a minimal invasive thing. The only thing is we are immobile. We are fixing it with a proper nail, which is taking care of all the other problems. That is why, but otherwise, the reduction is an open reduction. That is very important. Right. Uh, as right. far as uh, talk about non-union. I will say that uh, the, the standard procedures for non-union and uh, though the question can be about two plates and one plate and always it will be when there and there are many papers which have come in favor of two plates being there. I don't know if any of us applies two plates regularly. No, as regularly, Asim, always. Asim always. Always. Default. <laughs> not for the non-union, not yeah. primary. We are talking about non-union. Yeah, for a non-union. Yeah. And uh, go to default option. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so and the other one is uh, forearm nailing. We all have seen for a long time. Very good. Uh, so I can't say much more about it. It is very clear cut subject. And uh, Doctor Gadevane, one thing I will say: What is against? This uh, square nail which we are using has gone out of the vogue and probably is not available anymore. No, they are available, but they are more stiffer, sir. Very, very stiffer. Yeah. How and, will? Uh, how will? What is their place today? Today. Uh, today, I think uh, very few people are using only in the segmental fracture. That's all. That's all. Especially in Allah, I think Allah is still maybe uh, uh, one can do it. Uh, Conduct, sir. Yeah, the 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 previously square nails were used as an open procedure. Yes. Where a lot of non-unions were there. <clears throat> the use of square nails in a close fashion, the healing is fast, and even if some loss is uh, radial bow is there, still the function is beautiful. It's almost as good or almost better. I have a collection of around eight to ten cases where one forearm was. Plated on both the nail, both the bones, and the other one is nailed. And the patient vouched that their function on the nail side is better. Of course, their implants are removed. Also, refracture is also not there after the removal of nails. So, advantages to use square nails as well. And I have been using square nails as well as the tense nail with with equal functions. Um, I had no issue, except that you need to get the radial bow. And how to get the radial bow as far as possible to the extent uh, is a uh, trick. So that is what is the crux of the forearm nailing. And I do have good results with forearm nailing. However, I do continue to use plates for all Gavizzi and Gall Mantija fractures and, and in required patients where the patient's conditions um, are satisfactory for a good plating procedure. Dr. Patankar, are you there? Yeah, but Dr. Patankar is there. Hello. Yes. Dr. Patankar, yes. your indications for forearm plating? Galaxy and Montage fractures. So that is where you would use uh, the plates. Yes. Definitely. And so non-unions. Non 
which requires bone rafting and other reconstructive procedures, which Asim has shown. And do you do ever plating for metacarpal fractures? Yes, I have done a lot of platings. Which one? Plating for metacarpals and phalanges now. Uh, in the last two, three years, I have done a lot of plating because of the advent of these low profile AO and uh, Martin plates. Initially, uh, I, I still my preference is for nailing for transfers and uh, short oblique fractures. But comminuted fractures, patients who present late, who, have, who require open reduction, in those cases, you require uh, uh, plating. Yeah. There was one question on uh, the use of VAC immediately after debridement. I'll answer that question. That So after removal, once you do a debridement, reduce the tunique, wait for 7 to 10 minutes, let all the bleeding ends subside, cauterize all the bleeding ends. Uh, you can use hydrogen peroxide, use cyclocapron, or the uh, tenexamic acid. And once the whole bleeding stops, then only apply the VAC canister. Otherwise, a rapid bleeding can happen. Uh, but usually, it's not a problem. Use at a low pressure. Use only 25 milliliter on day one. And then you can increase the next day. Otherwise, bleeding can be encountered. Uh, maybe we can apply it and don't, don't put any negative pressure at that time and put it after two days. Is that okay? Uh, using... Uh, no negative pressure usually is not recommended because okay. the fluid would collect inside and would leak the seal. So use low pressure at 25, then increase to 75 the next day is quite good. And sir, yeah. I used it in a terribly infected and uh, above knee amputation system, industrial in injury. So uh, the way you described that you control all the bleeding on the table, don't be in a hurry to put the vac. Wait and intraoperatively VAC was put immediately at the time of operation and it doesn't lead to sucking the blood from the system. Yes. You exactly described that you ought to be patient. It takes about 20 minutes. Yes. Okay. Wait for that time. So with this, I think uh, we have come to the end of this webinar. Thank you all the faculty members. Thank you, Gade Gone, sir, on you, sir. the chairs of IOA. And uh, everyone uh, um, presented so well. Uh, for delegates, for any your comments on uh, YouTube, if there are any comments, I think you can mail them or you can put your comments so that uh, we can uh, conduct this webinars in more useful manner. Thank you very much. We Dr. should thank Dr. Goyal. He spent so much of yes, yes. yes. He's the senior uh, most. I have requested him to be here for the three hours, <laughs> and he has graciously accepted. The president, whatever. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank Have you. a nice day. I request the ortho TV to please stop the uh, transmission. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Ashok, I must uh, appreciate your presence throughout the webinar. Thank you so much. Sure, Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. It was yes, Chandak, sir, he has done more than any other teacher to revolutionize yes. orthopedic training. Uh, it, it's a revolutionary. Indian orthopedics on the global map. Yes. It is revolutionary. All, you, all those Goras, uh, they must be wondering ki se aata sab kachra itna, or itna bagarda patients or uh, they hardly ever see uh, something like this. I have seen some international webinars where uh, the slides from our webinars have been taken up. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I have I've copied on my phone. Oh. <laughs> yeah. so Good to is, listen. Yeah, that is that is so nice. And and, on and the jugards, uh, our jugards. Yes. Jugards. Yeah. That is Imagine so nice. the condition. Sometimes we are working. <laughs> Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. All the compliments. Bye. 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 Yes, Bye. 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 Bye.